Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's special meeting work session. And we are here, here to discuss the New Valley Elementary School architectural design presentation. I'd like to ask Dr. Watts to call this meeting, uh, call this work session to begin. Thank you, President Venkat Aslan, members of the board, Ms. Halley, community and friends. At this time, I'd like to call Chief School Operations Officer, Mr. Israel Vela to the podium, and he's already there to begin our presentation and to introduce the architects for the New Valley Elementary School and New Academy facility. Already here, you can tell we're excited about tonight. So, so uh, members of the board, President Van Gosselman, Dr. Watts, Ms. Halley, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here tonight to share with you um, our architectural designs for two buildings that are in store for us here in the Kent School District. Uh, excited about this. I know we've had a couple of work sessions to speak to you about some of the capital projects that are happening, but especially tonight, uh, we have a little treat for you uh, from our architects to, to show you just what, what these buildings are going to look like. Um, uh, I won't steal the thunder, uh, but they will be sharing a little bit about what they're going to talk about, um, what they're going to be sharing with you, both from a visual standpoint and kind of our plans moving forward. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to our Director of Capital Planning and Facilities, Mr. Dave Buzzard. Dave. Thanks, Israel. Uh, members of the board, Dr. Watts, Ms. Halley, staff and community friends. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am about tonight. I mean, you can just look at the grin on my face, you all know. Um, it's been over a year. Uh, this thing has been kept in my office. Uh, poor Stephanie over there is like, can I get a copy of it? No. Um, Christy, the same way. So again, uh, highly, highly, highly privileged, uh, very, very happy um, to be on this side of the podium and be able to present something to you. Uh, these architects and engineers have worked diligently um, for over a year, like I said to bring you bring this to you but the work's not done this is just the beginning of it so we still have a few more months to get things dialed in and we'll be breaking ground uh, in early spring of 2020 so without further ado I'm not gonna steal their thunder either uh, Steve Busick and Katie Pond with Hutterball and Aramis architecture well you heard it twice already. To say that we're excited to be here is an understatement. <laughs> we're very happy. We appreciate the opportunity to go ahead and present in front of you this evening. Uh, like, Dr. like Israel and, and Dave mentioned, we're going to walk you through some of the plans and some of the concepts that drove the designs. These are concepts that were, uh, they evolved out of several planning meetings with different groups for both facilities. 
and uh, we're going to show you some some images as, as well as a couple of uh, animations that go through each of the facilities. Um, I do want to point out that the presentation that we have up on the board, you have in front of you in the stapled packet as well, so you can follow along. Uh, we did also provide the boards that are up here in, in front of the uh, session, and you can see left to right, New Valley Elementary School is on your left, and then on your right is the uh, new academy facility. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here uh, with the New Valley Elementary School. Um, Okay, that's all right. We'll follow along here. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the site, uh, we are located on Military Road South. Uh, the one thing to note here is that this is in the city of SeaTac, so we're working with the city of SeaTac as the juris primary jurisdiction for all of our permitting processes um, in conjunction with the city of Kent for uh, some site-specific utilities. Uh, military road here, as you work your way from the west to the east, is much higher in elevation than the eastern portion of the site. The site also slopes uh, at the same time from north to south. So basically your southeastern corner is the lowest point of your entire site. Uh, essentially when you're on military road, you're going to be at the roof elevation of the two-story volume of this building. So there is a fairly significant slope. So what we did with the design is we actually tried to take the facility and nestle it into the topography of the site. We utilized the existing, what was previously the KMVA campus site, plus the additional residential parcels to accommodate for the uh, visitor and staff parking area with its separate entrance on the south as well as our bus loop, which is on the north. Um, coming off of the bus loops circumventing around the site, we have continuous fire lane access. That's a a direction that's uh, required by the fire authority. You'll see that off the parent drop-off, you have immediate access to the main entry, highlighted there, labeled main entry. Um, we also have a secondary access, thank you, <laughs> main entry here. We also have a secondary access that comes off the same plaza space. That way for evening events, you can have uh, community members come directly into the gym and multi-purpose room. We can get into specifics about how the building is zoned later, but just know that you have that flexibility in the program. Uh, coming off of the bus drop and also that main plaza area, you'll notice that we also have a separate entrance for the kindergarten classroom wing, which is located on the northern portion here of the facility. This is a single story volume, but much the same as the other classrooms. That way it has the same flexibility in design. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and point out a couple other things on the site, get everybody grounded. That way as we're looking through some of the visuals, you'll be able to have some points of reference and some context for what we're looking at. Um, kindergarten wing again located on the north here. So outside they have a separate kindergarten play area, fully fenced. Um, it has a specialized rubber surface, that way they can have a, a play toy equipment area. Uh, we do have a couple of um, rain gardens that are for stormwater treatment located around the site. We have our play fields located in the southeastern corner. Again, with the topography, we had to build this area up fairly significantly to get it to be a, a level play field area. Uh, we are accounting for the future installation of two modular classroom buildings should they be needed. Uh, as we continue to work our way back east and around the site, we have this outdoor hard playscape area across here, so basketball courts, four square, tetherball, those types of things. This area that's a little bit lighter gray with two basketball courts under it, that's a covered play area, so that's the same roof projection coming off the multi-purpose and gym wing that covers that area. And then nestled in between here, so as you come in, as you, as you come into the main entry, you're gonna be able to look out into this outdoor learning courtyard space. So this is an outdoor gathering space. It'll have the opportunity for planting beds or just casual seating, just another space to break out and, and take the kids to. Uh, as we work our way around the south portion of the building, uh, this is your service courtyard kitchen and then some auxiliary parking for staff members who arrive early in the morning. Going to go ahead and take you into the floor plan a little bit here. Um, again, on the northern portion, this is your kindergarten ECE wing. Uh, our main entry is you come in, you'll be able to proceed either in through the vesti secure vestibule into the main office space and then back out into the general circulation space. From there, you have the options of going into 
the kindergarten wing or continuing east and then down this, uh, like not even a half flight of steps. It's about four foot elevation change across here as you work your way into the, the primary classroom wings. Uh, essentially, these two classroom wings, the southern and central classroom wing, are duplicated on the first and the second floor. But what you'll notice is that <clears throat> The prototype here is essentially a group of four classrooms clustered around a flexible space. That way each cluster has its own identifying flexible space that students can break out into. In conjunction with that, we've also accounted for um, a couple of offices that are located over here. As you work your way down towards the multi-purpose room, again, you'll be going past the administrative area. This is that secondary entrance that can be zoned for evening use. Uh, your multi-purpose room, you have a back of house circulation here for your music and your stage. This access corridor here, this would be your support entrance. So you have your mechanical room and primary electrical room and custodial rooms in this space. That way, as that support staff is coming into the building, they can come in their own entrance, not be encumbered by having to track all the way through the, the primary facility. Again, you have your multi-purpose room and then your supporting gym space as well and then your outdoor cover play space. On the second floor, like I mentioned, the classroom wings are identical to what we saw down below. The one thing to note here is that the two primary elements beyond the classroom wings are the library and the staff lounge. Uh, for us, we took a very different approach to the library in this facility. Instead of making it an enclosed room or location, we made it part of the circulation. So that way you actually circumvent through the library space to an extent when you are going from, let's say, your classroom wings upper level over and down into the cafeteria multipurpose space. So that way you have a different experience on how the library is being used. We know that the, the idea of the library has changed so dramatically over five years, 10 years, 15 years. It's going to continue to evolve. So we're finding it more responsive to educational needs to make it a little bit more flexible and a little bit different than what we've seen in the past. So again, still a destination within the building, but something that you'll actually experience and go, and, and go through every day. Uh, again, we have our staff lounge here. This space, we were asked to make this something that's very special. We're still working to, to get to that point. So um, unfortunately, we won't be able to show you a lot of that today. But um, all of those design decisions are forthcoming at our upcoming uh, color and materials meetings. So with that, I'll turn it over to Katie Pond. All right, so not everyone stares at floor plans all day and can just immediately visualize what the building looks like. So we actually created this video walkthrough of a portion of the building that we want to kind of narrate you through. We're coming in from the main parking lot like you were just dropped off at school. This is your new clearly identified main entrance. Um, you can see it'll be covered here, sheltered from the rain if you're waiting to be picked up. And you enter into this secure vestibule. Um, those double doors ahead of you will be locked during the day, and instead you'll be funneled straight into the main administration. Walking in beh behind these yellow walls are your main administrative offices, and you can see that all of these people in the main office have a fantastic view out over the parking lot over anybody who's coming in off of Military Road. We've built in a lot of file cabinets, a lot of cabinets for storage. Apparently, no matter how much we put in, it's never enough. Never. So we've really doubled down here. Um, and you can see that these two chairs here uh, that we're walking past right now, it's going to be really clear as you come in through the front doors who you're supposed to be talking to, who you need to be checking in with. The cot room is on your right-hand side through an operable window, and now we are in the lobby of the school. Looking up at that balcony, that's a little peek into the library. Ahead of you where those trees are, we're looking out over the learning courtyard out to the big toy beyond. If we went up that staircase, it would be into a classroom wing, but we're going to pass this yellow, con or sorry, orange construction on our right hand side. That's a display for student artwork. And we're going to go down into the kindergarten wing. Each of the three classroom wings are connected by these very open bridges to help kind of um, bring a lot of natural light into the facility, help you connect with the outdoors as you're moving through the facility. 
The darker material on the top of the walls is a tackable surface, and the wood texture down below is a more durable wainscot so that um, the walls stand up to the test of time. Going into a kindergarten classroom now, you can see lots of cabinetry, tall casework there on the left-hand side, some vertical poster storage, flat file drawers, lots of open bookcases. You can see here there's a kindergarten-sized sink for the little guys, as well as some um, more cabinets. And through that door, each kindergarten classroom had its own dedicated restroom. Orange cubbies in the backs are for each student with hooks on the outside for hanging up coats and more storage up above. The furniture we're showing in this model is simply a suggestion. It has not been vetted by anybody. We just wanted you to give you a sense of the scale. Uh, the front of the classrooms all feature a large interactive display board flanked by two whiteboards. The walls tackable? These they are, yes. Both the front and the back classrooms are all tackable in those. And we'll go into one more classroom and we'll point that out. Heading back now towards the lobby, you can see again those peaks out into that learning courtyard. Um, looking down that corridor towards the gym, we're going to take a left past the elevator and go down four feet into the first classroom wing. These orange pieces here are um, student benches, nooks for places to bring a, a child and work on some one-on-one -on -one instruction. They're flanked by two tall pieces of cabinetry that can be used to store supplies for paraeducators, for teachers that need overflow, really for anything the building wishes to designate it for. Oh, excuse me. Let me get us back to where we were here. This is one of the flex spaces. This one is also shared with two offices, potentially for specialists or counselors. Um, again, we'll leave that up to the experts. But they also um, look out onto that flex space so that they feel like they're more part of the school community. It's not something that you're sent to. It's more something you just happen to walk past. Each of these classroom wings has its own dedicated restrooms. And now we're going to go into one of the typical primary classrooms. So the yellow wall, this brown material here, as well as over here and behind the sink, and over here, all of that is tackable. Your primary classrooms are very similar to the kindergarten, but they do have a slightly larger scale cabinets. They all still have, everybody has a sink. Um, these ones are wheelchair accessible. The other six flex spaces within the building that don't have offices attached to them have those window benches, which are going to be a really fun feature, kind of fun little kid's nook. And now we're going to continue down the corridor. If you were to go out these doors, you could access the playgrounds, but we're going to go up the stairs and take you quickly through the upstairs. As Steve mentioned, it's the same floor plan on both floors of both of the typical classroom wings. The kindergarten is just a single story, but the others have two stories. That leaves us with 38 direct instructional spaces, 38 classrooms, in addition to your music and your stage and your PE and all of those. Where it says green in big gold letters right there, that is our placeholder for a potential option of wayfinding. We could pick a theme for this school by committee and use a different element to kind of designate each of these flex spaces to give it a little more identity, a little more community, a sense of being. Passing another two offices, you can see each of those flex spaces equipped with potentially another interactive display board as well as tackable and writable surfaces. And we're going to go up now into your library. The name of the game here was flexibility. We have no idea what a library is going to look like in 10 years. I do not have a crystal ball, unfortunately. I would love if I did. So we've done lots of built-in open bookcases around the edge of the facility. And everything on the inside, including the circulation desk, is on casters. It can move. We wanted there to still be a space where you could have direct instruction. So you will see the interactive display board there on your right-hand side in between the two orange window seats. 
And then we're gonna weave our way down through to the reading nook. We think this space will have really fantastic views out over the trees to the um, other properties beyond. And then we'll also have fun views out towards Rainier. So this reading nook has a set of built-in stairs for the younger grades to use as they're being read to by your amazing librarian. Um, it has another window branch um, and some potential options for soft seating for the older grades to choose where they want to study. You can see you can look down into the lobby space. And now we're going to take a right hand turn and go down towards the gym and the multi-purpose area. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, the staff lounge, when we get there, will be on your left-hand side through one of those two doors. Both of them will access the same space. And now we're on the stair overlooking the multipurpose space. Now this uh, commons will allow for your lunch period. We're setting up to allow for two serving lines, but you probably will only need one. But flexibility is always a good thing. And again, more display spaces, more um, areas and opportunities to display student work and student pride, school pride. Um, the wall between the gym and the multipurpose is an operable partition. It can be closed, same as between the multipurpose room and the stage that you're seeing here on your right hand side. So you can close down those spaces and use them individually should you need to. The gym itself, you can begin to see, has a large divider curtain so that this gym can run two sections of PE concurrently, um, which will give you a great deal of flexibility with a school population this size. That curtain is more opaque on the bottom, but still transparent on the top, so you really have supervision over both sides at the same time. It's really just fabric. <laughs> Lots of nice natural lighting through a skylight in the multipurpose and then some windows right here in the gym. It'll make it a really inviting space. It can be opened right up for big events so that you can seat people all the way to the back of the gym and still be able to see the stage. We're looking out now on the courtyard and the play area for the school. Since we are surrounded by residential properties, we wanted to make sure that this uh, facility still felt like it fit into that residential context. Um, we're still using materials and roof slopes um, that echo those types of Pacific Northwest feels. And that, in a nutshell, is the New Valley Elementary School. Any questions? There was a couple of things I missed, and we didn't go through everything. Yes. Um, but there were a couple of places where there were stairs only, four or five stairs up or down without a yes. ramp necessarily nearby. Um, so I wanted to know, there's a ramp that looks like out the back. So I want to see like, what, what's the typical path of a kid who has crutches or in a wheelchair um, to kind of get into the library? Absolutely. So right where those groups of four stairs are, Steve, if you could point for me, that would be fantastic. There is a four stop elevator. And so you will be able to come straight in off the lobby there. into that elevator and stop on any one of those levels. All right. And again, a lot of that uh, change in elevation for the floor plate was derived by the mm -hmm. topography of the site. And then and it, it may not be known because you're looking at the building itself, but what are the, what are the boundaries around the other properties look like? Is it wood? Is it fence? Is it? So this facility will have all new perimeter site fencing. Okay. Down all the way around. Um, we're going to have control points here. There'll be an access gate that the fire and staff can get through. There'll also be one located right here as well. That way you have the front portion mm -hmm. that's readily accessible and you have your secure back as well. What about the, the tree, air, tree area that goes out there? So again, this does slope significantly and it was heavily wooded. So we couldn't really feasibly use it for building structure, but what we are doing is we're using it for stormwater management. We're dispersing some of our stormwater in that direction. And we've fenced it off from the school property itself so you don't lose a second grader up on the hill somewhere. <laughs> I'll jump into uh, Dr. Yeah. Hardy, ask, you asked about a question. And I thought about this too, as well as like, what's the site from neighborhood? So this right here is heavily uh, vegetated. Mm -hmm. So uh, even when we put the fence in, the vegetation there's there's one house that's there. 
there's really nobody that has a clear sight view without some type of cottonwood tree or other vegetation here. This is all going to be woods, and then from here to here is dog park. Yeah. So, as a matter of fact, we even got a question, what type of audible bell are we going to use right. on the school because it would disrupt the dogs? <laughs> so we're going to use the annoying yak one. <laughs> Something else other than a squeal. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, could you kind of uh, give us a sense of how this compares to our newest elementary in terms of size? And sure. Uh, it's hard to. If, if you, yeah, we can speak to that. Uh, Katie mentioned there are 30. 38 direct instructional spaces. And I believe that number is 10 more than what was provided at Covington, which mm -hmm. was 28. That is, that is correct. Because originally it was um, at Panther Lake, when it was reconstructed, it was 24, and then you added four more to it, I believe is what happened. Um, so we actually have a facility here that's about 91,000 plus square feet. Uh, again, 38 direct instructional spaces. Um, we are fitting it onto a 9.67 or 75 acre site. So it's pretty compact actually for an elementary school. I'm looking around to find out what this one is, uh, comparability to uh, other districts. We do know that Puyallup uh, does have the largest elementary school that is getting ready to open uh, this year and it will hold 1,100 el elementary students and we just found out they're going to have portables. So that is the largest one in the state. I would think that I'm looking, somebody told me that this one would probably be the third or fourth largest elementary in the state. 758. Yeah. And one of the reasons, uh, President Vine was awesome about this is this is our most westerly school. So this is it. I mean, you know, this school is going to be right on our boundary line. I mean, there, there's nothing across the road that's going to come to us. So everything gets bused to that. So that's why we wanted to make sure it had capacity. And it's a new concept. There's nothing in a district that looks like this. Uh, for years and years and years, we did a Northwest Craftsman look. Um, I like that look. I, I completely agree with it. Um, but I'm going to toss Dr. Watts and I underneath the bus, and he said, Dave, I want something different. Um, and I think we got it. And I think that this is the, you know, it's innovative, um, it's collaborative. We got a lot of uh, uh, buy in with our uh, staff who, who helped us design that, and I can't give them enough credit. Uh, even with Stephanie and, and her team, Chrissy, who, who is new here, um, you know, just getting in the information. But going where school is going now, that's why flexible spaces are so, I mean, you know, four, four walls and a ceiling and one door, that's a, that's a done deal. I mean, we can't think like that anymore. At least I don't want to think like that. So we need to think about how creative we can be with spaces. And then we haven't even talked about furniture. Furniture is going to be another thing where Dr. Watts and I are going to work, and, and the team will work really closely with the, with principals about that because it, again furniture makes the building as well too and including staff on another note as you recall we did hire our planning principal christy white who's currently at cave elk right now she's been involved in this process from day one in fact before she even started she was <laughs> coming in meeting with dave and and yeah. looking at and the furniture as you heard today is just you put that in there they're even looking at the different types of arrangements that you can do with furniture for different instructional spaces moving in and so she's all over that um, she's excited about that two quick questions one on the stairways um is it some place a few months ago and they had for the littler kids they actually had a second bar on the mm -hmm. stairway so it was more for like the little kids to be able to rather than the great big high ones is that something we're looking at is possibly putting in a double rail absolutely very, very possible there's nothing code prohibitive about putting in a second rail is that it was really nice for littler mm -hmm. folks to be able to do that. And then what about safety? So outdoor entrances and... Um, I believe at your October 3rd meeting, you heard from Dave and all the fantastic projects they were completing over the summer, including all their security updates. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that was establishing the district standards at that point in time. You were retrofitting all your existing facility, facilities with new technology. That is the standard by which we are designing. So all the exact same things you heard about in your last meeting with Dave are implemented into this project. That's everything from the Promethean boards to the access control to meeting with security staff and evaluating camera locations. All of those things are implemented. Yeah, let's walk through that real quick, Steve, and thanks for bringing that up. And Debbie, that's a great question. So I'll bring it to the attention. So you can't really see it right here, but if this is Military Road. You're coming into the beginning of the school. This will be a fence that will come all the way around, six foot, all the way around. 
and the fence will come again right here. So everything, there will only be one, two, three major accesses to the school. This will be the main entry. This will have a card reader, card reader, card reader. So, and then again, when we talk about, uh, Steve said, zoning it off, what's really nice is in this hallway right here where this line is, that will be a uh, grate that will come down out of the ceiling. Now people can come in here, use the bathroom, all the purpose room, gymnasium, all day, all night long, whenever they want to, and they can't access the rest of the school. Mm -hmm. well, on the back side, also, um, card readers everywhere, and you missed the best point. So, <laughs> none of our schools has an outdoor bathroom. Mm -hmm. Children always have to go inside to go to the bathroom. This is me, and I said, no, we're going to put two bathrooms out here, and we're going to put them on card readers. Mm -hmm. So we in integrated into mm -hmm. that design. So when students go out of the building to go to recess, how do they, where are they exiting? They can exit off of the main. If they want to, they can come out of this door here. They can come out of that door there. Um, they can come out of any any appropriate place they want to. Again, a lot of them, all elementaries, and they'll all be for uh, their master schedules. Do they come off of the playground and come right into the, uh, for the multi-purpose room? They can come straight in here, right down to the multi-purpose room, or vice versa. And again, all of those doors are locked through the day. Uh, again, fenced all the way around. So uh, very, very secure. Steve, you want to share the camera, the infrastructure for camera? So Tim uh, Kovic and I just uh, went through that with the design team, uh, safety services, and uh, we're looking at probably 53 cameras. I would think that's about right. Uh, and I think uh, the new academy would be about the same because, you know, every time you come around a corner, every time you have avoided area you know uh, this the straight lines are great this is perfect but when you start getting into all these crevices you want to be able to have visibility in there what, what is it normally for an elementary school it's about 32. Mm -hmm. our elementary school is about 59,000 square feet so yeah. i was going to say this is a little bigger <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the design itself the, the floor plan in the way that again we did cluster the floor classrooms around uh, flex space but you notice that we pulled them apart. We did try to align some of the views out, but then we pulled each of these apart. That was a concept that was actually driven by your staff and the, the programming unit. That was one of the concepts that they came up with. So really what you're looking at is really been designed by a lot of individuals that are on your, on your uh, staff as well. I have a question about the separation between the multi-purpose room and the gym. Is that going to be it will be done daily, very movable, so that they can go in and have lunch while the gym's still going on. Yeah, that normally that partition wall is always closed. Okay. That is, it's nor it's closed uh, okay. normally at operational. Uh, if they want to open it up for uh, an event, yep, an assembly, that's what they usually do. And they do have a man door in addition to the large operable partition to be able to access that gym. And what is the a small partition? What's the capacity for a lunch crowd? I think we have 16 tables in there, and eight, so 104, I think. So that's what we've talked about. Yep, of how that schedule runs. Yeah, so, so I'm going to keep us moving here in order to get you on on schedule. I apologize. Um, we're going to talk now about the new academy facility. I want to quick you quickly get you up to speed on the site plan now. When we were handed this project, we took it to our engineers and they said, okay, in order to make the most of your budget, you need to preserve that field and you need to keep as much of that parking and driveway where they are as possible. So that's what really led to the organization of the site on this. You can see you come in off of the same intersection that you do currently, or you would have before it was demolished, um, into this building. The Northern portion will be for the visitors, for people dropping off children, the car traffic, and then that lower loop will be dedicated for buses. The topography, again, is quite steep on this site. When you come in off of 108, this is at quite a different grade and it slopes down quite dramatically as you reach here. So you're actually entering on the upper floor of the building and then you'll need to traverse down the stairs or down the elevator and come out on the lower floor into this courtyard space. But that actually creates this fantastic opportunity for this protected courtyard play space on a very busy street corner. We think it's actually um, a fantastic space for this school. 
So this is the upper floor now. You come in into this main vestibule. The main office takes up the major portion of this middle building here. On the outside, you see another library, and it's flanked on either side with your instructional spaces. In this building, we have paired three general classrooms with a lab space, a flex area, and a conference room. Now, the science labs are self-explanatory. Those are meant for science. They'll be equipped with things like gas and air and a fume hood in one of them so that you can do your biology or chemistry. The project lab will be something more flexible that can be used for art. It can be used for your career and technical education classes. It's meant to be a larger, more durable space that you can just throw anything you want at it, um, a wipeable floor, large sinks, that sort of thing. The flex space, again, will be filled with um, very different types of seating, different types of furniture in order to allow small groups of the students to come together and work. And this conference room is actually slightly larger than we would typically put in a, in a middle or high school. It's meant for you to bring maybe eight to 10, maybe 12 students into that space with um, a community partner, a mentor, a, par a paraeducator, another teacher, really having lots of options for them to create different scales of learning within this facility. On the lower floor, you can see that those educational spaces are mirrored again. It's the same layout. Underneath the library is your staff lounge, along with another flexible small classroom that can adapt to whatever program needs may happen there. We have our music classroom, the stage opening out onto a multi-purpose space that is intended to be used for eating, gathering, light athletics, um, with very large storage rooms off of it in order to help accommodate whatever programs may crop up over the next 30, 40 years. Ready? Yeah. All right, and with that, we're gonna take a little walk through new academy facility. We're actually moving south parallel to 108th here as we would be facing the bus loop there, right directly in front of us, and we're gonna turn right, go into the main entry. Again, your administrative area is this red volume that's off to your left, your secure vestibule's directly in front of you. Part of that vestibule space is a display case that's two-sided, so we can display um, student artwork or merit awards. Again, the theme here was creating a, comp a very different building than what we just looked at at New Valley. The context for New Valley is very residential. This context is much more commercial. That in conjunction with the types of programs and the age groups that you're addressing here, we really wanted to make this a little bit more of a sophisticated building. So you'll see bright pops of color, different types of furnishings, but we still have that same sense of transparency from the administrative wing back out into our vestibule spaces, from classroom wing to administrative wing, from interior to exterior. We're gonna be working our way west here Directly in front of us would be the outdoor covered area. We're actually gonna turn left here and go towards the library. As you enter the library to your left would be a cyber bar. It's a little, it's a higher seating area that would have uh, charging stations, USB ports, those types of things for student use. Again, bringing that color into the space and then allowing for those great views out over towards the lower portion of the site. On the perimeter, very similar to New Valley, we have fixed furnishings, and then everything on the interior would be mobile, movable furnishings. Um, tackable wall surface as much as we can get, but we still also have an instructional space in this uh, library as well. Directly over there in front of us. And then this space is supported with its own office, and then uh, there's also another small reading space uh, over towards the left-hand side of the office. So we're gonna go out the back door of the library here. Turn left. As we're walking down the hall here, we're actually walking towards the northern wing to our left would be the stairs that would lead downstairs. 
Again, those connecting bridges with lots of transparency, bringing natural daylight, letting you al allow for views both directions. To your left there are two offices. Those are for community partner use. Each of the educational, during the day, each of the um, classroom uh, wings has ganged uh, male and female restrooms as well as staff restroom and then a, a gender neutral restroom as well. This is one of our flex spaces. One of the comments that we heard early on was the stairwells that were in one of our original concepts were much too secluded. They didn't have visual control. So you'll notice that our circulation actually is right around the glass box that is your conference room. It has lots of visual control to it. We're currently in one of the lab spaces here. Um, glass, glass front door shelving up above, a lot of perimeter casework but yet flexible enough to account for uh, student capacity. So here's one of our conference rooms. You can see over to the right is our stairway. So you can see out from the lab space into this flex area, down into this stair portion of the stairwell. And then this portion of the stairway is visible from this main corridor well, as well as this lower conference room. We're now walking towards the west, which would be towards the multi-purpose room. There, again, there is a door assembly that we just went past that allows you to zone this building for evening use. So you can use the multi-purpose room. As you saw on the site plan, it does have access point from the parking and drop-off area. In the multi-purpose room, again, we're providing these cyber bars and different types of seating arrangements, more fixed, low seating around the perimeter. We're showing round tables in here. Uh, directly in front of us is an office. We have our stage and performance area that has a uh, stair assembly that leads over to the right. And you can see there's like a raised seating platform. That actually continues out to the exterior as well, creating the stepped seating arrangement. We're underneath the large cover play, looking southwest here. And like Katie mentioned, we were tasked with trying to leave as much of the site intact, and we were able to do a lot of that. One of the things that we, the conclusion we came to was that the field does need a little bit of help, so we are going to essentially scrape the top off, re sod it, seed it, and, and get it up to speed. As we pan out, you can see the different volumes, but the general configuration is, we really, again, we tried to work with the topography of the site here and what the existing facility was as well. If you remember the, the previous configuration, it stepped down with the topography as well, but even and more, one, two, three, four, four elevations though. So here we tried to keep it to two, but still stepped down. on the lighting uh, in the classrooms I see I saw that there was quite a bit of lighting in the labs and various other and even in the previous presentation um, anything particularly special about the way you went about designing the lighting uh, actually a lot of the lighting that's required is dictated by the Washington State Energy Code and what that means is that we have to use uh, lamping that meets the, the specified wattage output. We do obviously use LED lighting. It's much more durable, you have, it's much more efficient, and it has a longevity that we're really looking for. In conjunction with that, what we have is uh, zoned daylighting controls. And what you'll notice is that most of the classrooms have two to three zones in them. And the ones that are on the perimeter towards the windows, their lights will be dimmer, and they will be turned off for the most part during the day if they are pick, if the sensors are picking up that natural light that they need. Um, but other than that, we really tried to give the classrooms, again, visual connections to other space, spaces as well as to the outdoors. In, in terms of efficiency, uh, you mentioned the dim lights. Uh, are there, is that incorporated throughout the? Absolutely. 
Yes. So about how many students? Look at my cheat sheet. 456. Uh, this facility is approximately 62,000 square feet. Uh, this one has 13 direct instructional spaces. You also have the four labs, the library, the multi-purpose room, and the music room as well. Okay. Yeah, we were just talking about uh, clinic, uh, the health clinic mm -hmm. um, that used to be. Um, is there any particular place that can so, be. The way we had set this up, because your community partners change with the needs of your students, we tried to just make as many flexible spaces all over the building as possible. So instead of having all of the administrative offices all clustered in one space, we've tried to really spread them out. So if you look here, we have two orange boxes. Those are two large offices. Another one down here. Two more on the ground floor. And then each of these conference rooms could potentially be used for day use by as an office as well if needed. Um, so if you had a mentorship program coming in and you wanted to kind of rotate students out through that space throughout the day, perhaps you could use one of those. And that's all in addition to the main conference room that's with administration for, for visiting parents and family use. Yes. Okay. Questions? Are the different floors going to be specified for One's going to be the Kent Mountain View, and one's going to be KPA. That you know, will that's going to be, be up to an them. operational thing. Okay. I'm keeping out of that. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm, that. I'm leaving that to the experts. Yeah, yeah we thought <laughs> enough about that because sure. I'm just wondering how do you get third through twelfth graders in? So in right all now we, classrooms and, we have not we have made no decisions on that. It's yeah. right now it's the operational piece. What we wanted to do is think about students and who are they. Um, the space that the 456. That's if they were all there. We have to look at the day. So I think um, our team here, one of our teams, looking at who, who are our students, who will they be, what do we want to offer not only with our students but with our community. <coughs> and that's why the building is the way it designed the way it is so that hopefully it will be used not just from 7.30 to 4, that it's used from a longer period of time. Now we're meeting the needs of kids in a different way. The other key thing, I don't know if you saw, we have uh, our bus a routing that is right there. And that's been a challenge in all of our academies. Um, and then we also have the entrance. We were challenged with that with the light, but in our partnership with the city of Kent, we're already working on a um, signal delay time on certain times of the day to allow our buses to get in and out. And so uh, some exciting, flexible use spaces. Just from this, maybe more operational, is how do most kids arrive at this facility? Is it by bus? Is it by private cars? By walking? Just thinking of coordination with, because I live right there, that hill going down gets closed during inclement weather, and so your option is somewhere else. Um, and, and just knowing of like how, how we work with either the city or rerouting or anything like that, or so ongoing. I can answer that. So I've worked with um, Ozzy. Uh, in the city of Kent and also with their traffic. This is one of the reasons why, if you notice that this lane, this lane is not there right now. Right. This lane is actually, that lane is the lane that's there. The city has actually asked us, well, basically told us, to come back. We'll well, they asked nicely the first time. <laughs> Karen, I said, okay, that's great. But they made us come all the way back the lane. They also are making us come out of this lane uh, coming back so we don't stack up this road. Yeah. Um, we had to give them some stackable uh, uh, channels, channelization through here, um, and we've worked closely with them. Again, this is a fire exit. Okay. So, uh, you know, again, you know, and, and we're trying to get another lane here as well, too. I mean, that's, that, that's what we're, we've always talked about this. Well, what, what can we do here? Because we know that we have bus and student traffic, uh, drop off and pick up traffic uh, here. But I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe Stephanie can ask, but I think where this building is lo where this building is going to be located, maybe more people think about this bus stop that's right here. Yeah, that is right there. So, who knows? One of the options that I think I shared in, a, in one of our 
uh, board meetings is that um, Justin has been working with um, utilization of ORCA cards. So we're using quite a few cards right now with high grad students, uh, but we use them for other students as well. And so um, that's why I really like the idea of having that bus stop there. Um, the other piece is you see Safeway right across the street. Um, not that that would be a, a safe place, but you've got a place where you can be dropped off because uh, we have parents and others who drive and drop these students off and then walk across that street there and you're really close to the facility. So again, lots of good options. Um, and uh, the team did a really good job. They talked about how the, the grading was. That was a real challenge and we managed to keep that entryway. That's gonna be really nice for circulation of traffic, buses, uh, or just, uh, you know, community who come to visit. What about available parking? When you're saying dropping off and parking. So we have 90, 90. 90 parking mm -hmm. spaces on the site, which is every square inch we could possibly get on here. Mm -hmm. We also have, it starts here, it goes all the way down this side, all the way over here. That's your parent drop-off zone. There's a lot of queuing mm -hmm. capacity on the site to get people off of this busy road. Then they'll utilize this fabulous turnaround mm -hmm. and they'll go back out the way they came with the light. Mm -hmm. So it's tight, but we think it's really doable. We think it's going to work well for you. If, if you were to stack a car, if you, if you were to stack cars from this point all the way awesome. here, around, and back to here, that would probably be about 80 some cars. At least. That's to me. And that's not taking up these parking spaces that we already have. So that was another thing. So that's just that everybody's there at one time. That doesn't happen. Pick up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much Thank for you. your presentation. We're excited for you. All right. We will recess the meeting for an executive session at 6.30 to review the performance of a public employee and to discuss with the Eagle Council representing the district litigation or potential litigation to which the district is likely to become a party.
Okay. It's not the one. It is uh, about a gig and a half, though. Does that matter? So I don't know if that's going to do bad things to the website or not. I can give you the video file separately. Yeah. You, you, you might. Let's try this. And give us the video file so we can If it does, then we can do something different. Okay, they're on that flash okay. drive, so if you want to oh, okay. put they're them somewhere. Them. Then Perfect. Okay. We're good. All right, thank you. Let me, let me go do that. Okay, wonderful. Hey, thank you. I'll bring this right back. Do you still want to do this? Do you still want to do this? Do you still want to do this? May even be able to do that in here sometime. Is I'll get a few easels and during meetings and stuff like that, we might be able to just put them out there. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, thank you. Yes, the 25th, is that right? Yep. And then we're set for... Oh, that's right, you want to get colors in. December. Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. Yep. So what you have, what we dropped off for you today, is our 50%. My estimator gets back next week. I'll be meeting with him to go through both projects. We'll be doing both projects at the same time, so you get a 50% estimate here in about a week and a half. Two that would be fantastic. I think that'll be. I think that'll. Yeah. Then you'll get 80% documents. Yep. And then, you'll get, and then you'll get 95 when we go to the constructability review, which is January 9th. Oh, it is January 9th. Yeah, I think that's the day. Yeah. For New Valley, and then Academy is in February. First right, week. Is that on my calendar already? Should be. It should be. I sent you a new mic. Okay, I accepted it. I'm sure I did. Okay. Like, because I knew I had something that day. 
Take a yeah. look. It starts at seven. So, let's see, where were you? Going? Yep. Uh, take a look at communication from the account from there. Uh, Sarah. Sarah, she, she's asking about the sortability of the account. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You don't want Taking care of the permit and take fees for the academy, but Kimberly took care of the permit fees for the valley, so that's all things. I got emails from Richard Mills, he's taking care of the VA by demonstrate, so he moved on the valley permit funds. So he's the third party. Third party reviewer. products and everything goes to pot. Exactly. All right, well, good. Thank you. We appreciate it. You soon. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, so, so no ball, but if I get the three signed jerseys. No, that's good. Yeah, that's, of course not. Everybody's going to check them out. Yes, okay. absolutely. I'm not going to be a... Yeah, you, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be a hater. I'm not going to be a hater. <laughs> Fantastic. starting to meet in the parking lot. Okay. I mean, are we talking on mass? I think the invite was for all, but I have no clue. Oh, okay. So we'll see. I just know what was shared with me. Okay. All righty.
Hi, Ray. How's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Well, yeah. I was looking for the Jedi. I didn't get her out there yet. Not yet. All right. Oh. All right. How are you Good. Busy. Never a dull day, is there? There isn't. <laughs> Keep me happy. I'll get you an agenda. Um, yeah, okay. No problem. Sure. I think I have a bed here on the cart. Oh, back here? Okay. Yeah, let me just... Uh, <laughs>
Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's board meeting. Uh, Dr. Rosen, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Welcome again to everyone this evening. This is the meeting of the Kent School District Board, which is held in public to comply with the Open Public Meetings Act. The purpose of the board meeting, I'm going to read a little bit of the process for audience participation tonight. We have a big crowd, so please bear with us. The purpose of the board meeting is for the board to conduct its business in public. During the meeting, the board will listen to but not respond to comments from visitors. Those wishing to comment must complete a comment card and give it to the board secretary before the meeting begins or no later than agenda item 4.0 presentations. No cards will be accepted once presentations have begun. Abusive public comments personally directed towards staff members will not be tolerated. The president may interrupt or terminate an individual statement when it's too lengthy, obscene, or irrelevant. When it is your turn to address the board, please state your name at the start of your testimony. And please limit your remarks to three minutes. We have a lot of cards this evening, so please do pay attention to that. And you will hear a timer when three minutes are up. Visitors who have completed a comment card indicating a desire to speak to an agenda item will be called upon at that portion of the agenda. And per board procedure, written material to provide <clears throat> board members with background information should be submitted to the superintendent's office at least one week in advance of the meeting. So at this time, I'd like to ask Dr. Watts if there are any changes to the agenda. Thank you, President Megadoslan. Members of the board, Ms. Halley, please note that there are no changes to the agenda this evening. Thank you, Dr. Watts. Uh, we will move on to 2.0, our superintendent report. And Dr. Watts, please. Thank you again, President Venkat Aslam, members of our board, Ms. Halley, community members, staff, and friends. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, to say thank you for everyone for being here. And we have uh, 
many good things to, to celebrate. We are off to a great start. At the same time, we can always uh, do better and begin by congratulating our finance team led by Dr. Jewel Harmon in organizational effectiveness and Mr. Ben Rarick, budget and finance. To all of our team members for this news just became uh, available and we will have a press release uh, tomorrow. It is my distinct pleasure to share this good news with every member of our community this evening on Friday afternoon. I received word from our staff that Moody's Investor Service has assigned an underlying rating of A1, which is a positive rating to King County School District number 415, otherwise known as Kent School District. Washington. 50 million unlimited tax general obligation bonds or GO bonds series 2019. Moody's has also assigned to these bonds an enhanced rating of AAA. And currently, Moody's affirms this A1 underlying ratings on the district's $225.7 million outstanding unlimited tax general obligation bonds. They've also noted that the outlook on the underlying rating has been changed from negative to positive. Additionally, Moody's ratings rationale. In other words, why has this ratings changed? What are the reasons? They've stated that the affirmation of the A1 underlying rating and the assignment of the positive outlook are predicated on our expectation that audited fiscal 2019 results will show a massive improvement in the district's financial profile results in fund balance and liquidity levels that are in line with better performing peers in the state of Washington. The improved financial standing of the district is the result of a strong financial management team that has made staffing adjustments, better utilized financial resources, and capitalized on adjustments in the state funding formula. The rating also takes into consideration its substantial and growing tax based in the Seattle metro area. As we know, one of the most expensive areas in which to live in this country, as well as the slightly above average socioeconomic measures. Debt and pension liabilities are moderate and supportive of this rating. They go on to state that the AAA enhanced rating is based on the bonds participation in the Washington State School Board Guarantee Program under this program, the state pledges its full faith, credit, and taxing power to guarantee debt service when, when due on qualified school districts voter approved general obligation bonds. The program rating reflects the pledge of the state of Washington, AAA stable, and strong program mechanics to ensure timely debt service payments on participating bonds. We expect that Moody's will release, if they have not already, their information uh, shortly, uh, and for our communication purposes, our Director of Communications and Public Affairs, Melissa Laramie, and I are working closely to uh, release this very positive news to the public on Thursday. Per our KSD communications protocol, our board was the first to hear this. You are hearing it this evening. We are very proud of this news. We know that we have come a long way, and yet we still have uh, more room to grow. And we thank our team's efforts to ensure that we are fiscally solvent and for the sustainable future. I would also like to thank our team from Human Resources. Uh, we are undergoing a very significant change in our employee benefits uh, statewide. Uh, if you've not heard, the program known as SEB, otherwise known as School Employees Benefits Board, starting January 1st, 2020, this program will administer health insurance and other benefits to all eligible employees in school districts, charter schools, and union represented employees of educational service districts in the state of Washington. The SEBS program first annual open enrollment runs from October 1st through November 15th. Today is November 13th. An enrollment is done through SEB, my account SMA for those who are employees they will be eligible for the SEB benefit starting January 1st, 2020, if they were anticipated to work at least 630 hours per school year. 
All employees will pay the same premiums regardless of part-time or full-time status as long as they meet or surpass the 630 hours mandate. SEB enrollment can be completed online through SEB, S-E-B-B, my account. The initial SEB open enrollment ends, as I mentioned, November 15th, 2019. And as of November 13th, these are the data that uh, show 3,370 employees are eligible for SEB benefits. 90%, we just received an update today, 90% of our employees Kent School District have built a profile and our records currently indicate that 323 employees have not established uh, an, as an, an SMA login. That information is important to maintain or obtain uh, health benefits. That concludes my report. Uh, good news, and we can always be better. But thank you for your time. I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Watts, and thank you to the finance team, our HR team, all of those who worked so hard to get us the great results today. Um, we will move on to our recognition portion, and I'd like to ask everyone to stay with us uh, to take some photos before we're done. And we will begin with our uh, proclamations. And the first one would be our American Education Week. Um, we're celebrating November 18th to the 22nd. And Director Strauss, uh, Vice President Strauss will read the proclamation. Thank you. Whereas public education is the backbone of our democracy, providing young people with tools they need to maintain our nation's precious values of freedom, civility, and equality, and whereas by equipping young students with both academic and social growth, schools give them hope for an equitable access to a productive future. And whereas public education employees, be they teachers, guest teachers, higher education faculty and staff, custodians, administrators, bus drivers, clerical staff, food service personnel, skilled trades workers, health and student services workers, security guards, technical employees, librarians, education support professionals, and other support staff work tirelessly to serve our children and our communities with care and professionalism. And whereas public schools are the foundation of neighborhoods and communities, bringing together parents and children, educators and volunteers, business leaders, and elected officials in a common purpose, now therefore it be be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Kent School District proclaims the week of November 18th through the 22nd, 2019 as American Education Week in the Kent School District and urges all students to join in this observation. Thank you. Our teaching and learning leadership will be accepting the proclamation. Anyone would like to say a few words, please? Thank you. So the Teaching and Learning Department is pleased to accept this proclamation on behalf of all of those who serve the students in the Kent School District at any level. We are all here to support and ensure that all of our students are successfully prepared for their futures. Thank you. we move to the next proclamation, I'd like to read the following statement, please. The Kent School District is committed to the success of every student, family, and staff in each of its schools. Learning and work environments are enriched and improved by the contributions, perspectives, and the very presence of diverse participants. To that end, we are recognizing National Native American Heritage Month with a proclamation. While we will not single out any one person or group of people to represent their entire race or culture to receive this proclamation, we do believe that it is important to take these opportunities for celebration and recognize as we work to create a learning environment that is respectful, welcoming, and inclusive 
for every student, family, and staff, and in which their diversity is valued and contributes to their success. So at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Director Hardy to read the proclamation for the Native, National Native American Heritage Month. Whereas the history and culture of our great nation have been significantly influenced by American Indians and indigenous peoples, and whereas the contributions of American Indians have enhanced the freedom, prosperity, and greatness of America today, and whereas their customs and traditions are respected and celebrated as part of a rich legacy throughout the United States, and whereas Native American Amer Awareness Week began in 1976 and recognition was expanded by Congress and approved by President George H. Bush in August 1990, designating the month of November as National American Indian Heritage Month, proclamations under variants of the name including Native American Heritage Month and National American Indian and Alaska Native Heritage Month have been issued each year since 1994. And whereas in honor of National Native American Heritage Month, community celebrations, as well as numerous cultural, artistic, educational, and historic activities have been planned, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Kent School Districts proclaims the month of November as National Native American Heritage Month in the Kent School District and urges all citizens to join in this observance. I'll ask um, Director Daniels to read the proclamation for the School Psychology Awareness Week, November 11th to the 15th. Whereas one of Kent School District's goals is to prepare all students to be college and career ready by collaborating and consulting with staff and families on best practices that will help advance student achievement, and whereas school psychologists have expertise in mental health, learning, and behavior, which helps students succeed academically, behaviorally, emotionally, and socially, and whereas data assessments are collected through evaluations conducted by school psychologists from building rapport and trust with students, and whereas school psychologists help students develop their individual abilities to be self-regulated learners, which include setting individual learning goals, designing a learning process to achieve those specific goals, and assessing the results to determine if the goals were achieved, and whereas School Psychology Awareness Week is an opportunity to raise public awareness of the importance of having school psychologists present at each school to help all children and youth become the best student they can be. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Kent School District Board of Directors proclaims November 11th through the 15th of 2019 as School Psychology Awareness Week and urges all citizens to recognize the importance of school psychologists to guide this generation and provide future generations a better chance for success. We have our school psychologists here. It's, thank you. On my behalf of the School Psychologists, we're pleased to accept this award, and I just want to say I have never worked with a finer group of people than those behind me that are so dedicated to the students in this district. All right, we'd like to ask everyone to stay and take some photos. Um, we'll start with the psychologist.
Okay, we are moving to our presentations for this evening, and hopefully we have everybody's cards. Uh, we will begin with our 4.01, our Institute for Community Leadership presentation. We're so excited always every year to have our students here present. And Dr. Watts, would you like to do the introduction, please? I'll be more than happy to. I'd like to call to the podium Dr. Nyla Rosen from the Institute for Community Leadership, who will introduce our amazing students who participated in the Gandhi King Global Initiative held at Stanford in October. Dr. Rosen. Thank you. Thank you, President Venkatasalam, for the invitation, directors, Dr. Watts, administrators and teachers, um, for the opportunity to join you this evening, as well as for the years of working together for the benefit of Kent students and families and schools. Thank you to the Institute's parents and grandparents who are here this evening and supportive teachers. We appreciate it. Warm greeting from Dr. Roy Wilson, our director. He's teaching a public administration class at Cal State East Bay this evening and couldn't be here. Christopher Castro Salgado and Faith Jenga will share a few words about the Global Gandhi King Initiative, to which the Institute has been invited to partner by Stanford's Martin Luther King Research and Education Institute. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, directors, Superintendent Watts, administrators and staff of the Kent School District, and parents and community members. We are honored to accept your invitation to offer a brief report back from our work within the Ghani King Global Initiative. The ability to learn, work, and teach is essential for the development of personal and social responsibility. And <laughs> An international coalition of academics, local and international governmental leaders, and nonviolence practitioners have created the Gandhi King Global Initiative. The Institute for Community Leadership was invited to Stanford University for the initiative's invocation conference because of our capacity as young people to represent youth voices in America. We were invited and participated because of our work and teaching of Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence. Our delegation was composed of nine Kent School District students and three institute staff. The conference featured three days of lectures and panel discussions. Along with that, we had the privilege of dialoguing with members from the Gandhi family and the King family, along with leaders from India, China, Mexico, South Africa, other nations, and from the United States. Following the conference, the Gandhi King Global Initiative invited us to be the youth organization to travel internationally to promote the, te to promote the teaching principles and practice of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. This is an honor, and we look forward to working with Stanford University in this endeavor. Oftentimes, we find ourselves distant from the world around us, lost in a materialistic mess of social media, money, cars, even keeping up with the latest office drama. Something both Gandhi and King teach us is that if we allow our consciousness to expand, we ourselves can be the solution to the violence that we see. We cannot expect others to change if we cannot change ourselves. The struggle for human progress is intergenerational. The materialistic mess superficially divides generations into false silos. Nonviolence recognizes that youth, adults, and elders are together involved in creating peace and democracy. We cannot have a better world, a more just world, unless we celebrate diversity. To celebrate diversity requires that we all work together in a common effort. Celebrating diversity means celebrating everyone, not just by race or nationality, not just by gender, not just by culture, but by job and economic station. We should, uh, we should celebrate, for example, janitors, we should learn from them and experience what they do. 
We should honor all secretaries, all dietitians, all bus drivers, all of those sitting, sitting right there. The life and culture of all people deserves to be celebrated. We should take better care of ourselves just as we should take better care of the earth. There's a conflict between how we are currently living in the planet and how we need to continue to live on it for sustained human development. We must all ask this question. How do we change ourselves to care for the Mother Earth who cares for us? Both Gandhi and King teach that we are foolish to overconsume our natural resources and energy because we are risking our own future. The conference devoted time to understanding democracy. Democracy is a process, not a destination. Throughout modern history, different classes and nations have developed different definitions for democracy. Both Gandhi and King consider democracy as the development of humanist ways by which we can care for one another. Democracy is a unifying process. It brings together. It is the process that develops equity, fairness, where individuals and groups share in the benefits and the sacrifices. The Gandhi King Global Initiative highlights the importance of civic education and civic engagement. At Stanford, we discussed how in the United States, civics classes in majority of our high schools are being terminated. Alongside this, there is a trend of civic disengagement, which leads to uncivic discourse. The Gandhi King Global Initiative calls for all of us to be active participants in the ongoing process of civil dialogue that protects and promotes humane relationships and a stronger democracy. Women and girls hold up over half the sky. Around the world, the women's movement brings together women and men, young and old, in the process of creating equal rights, equal pay, and equal access for women within the economic, political, and social structures. The eloquent representatives of the Gandhi and King family pointed out the significant growth of women's leadership participating in the struggle for peace with justice and the struggles for education and healthcare and in the process of making meaning. Human rights form part of the center of humanity's process of developing democracy. At the conference, we committed to learning and understanding the significance of the struggle for human rights all around the world. After World War II, in December of 1948, the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The declaration consists of 30 individual articles that outline a peaceful and just world. These articles range from the human rights to free speech, the human right to education, water, and shelter. We commit to popularizing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Madam President, as we are wrapping up our remarks, we humbly request the board's consideration of allowing all high schools to recognize human, sorry, International Human Rights Day on December 10th. At this time, we would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your attention. Start from the end. Uh, the Sorry, I was writing <laughs> taking notes. Um, I am just so excited to hear from, from this group again. Um, just an amazing opportunity for students. And I've met several of the students over the last several years, and I see some faces that are not here. I'm assuming they graduated and have gone on. <laughs> uh, but there are some faces that are familiar, and I just commend you for the work that you do. Um, I know many adults who are not as involved and knowledgeable and passionate about um, these subjects, and I am just amazed at 
the work that um, this institute puts into our students. And so I am just um, very excited and I cannot wait to hear uh, more about what you're doing. And I do follow you guys in the work that you do. Um, <laughs> And um, I have made a note about um, the date that you just said. That's why I was writing. So, but thank you so much. And I don't think we get to hear from students enough. I'm really um, one of the things that I really um, have always found important, and I really like to push for is hearing more from students. Mm -hmm. um, I think that really grounds us because that's why we're here. And so, what a great reminder that you, of you guys that you know why we're here is you guys. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't have a question. I just want to say how impressed I am with. You, the presence of the two of you, the way you speak, uh, what you are putting forward in the world. So we need you. Well done. No question, but I appreciate, I can echo what, what Director Daniel said about grounding us in what students care about. You know, I was like looking at the agenda, we have a public hearing on the sale of property. You probably don't really care about that that much, but hearing what you are interested about what you think we should do, what you think the district should do is, is very important. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you um, for sharing some of your experience. I do have one question. So what is the next step? So you said your group has been invited to continue to partner with Stanford. So um, do you know what your next steps will be? Um, so right now, every Saturday, the Institute holds um, classes for us to have the opportunity to share what we're sharing with you. And so by the dele with our nine students that had the opportunity to go with the delegation, our next step is to share with our community what we're doing. Because by sharing with others, we're growing their consciousness and we're allowing them to see the work that needs to be done and that can be done. Great. Thank you. I do appreciate Thank you. being here tonight. So thank, thank you. I also thank you so much for taking our invitation and uh, we're always inspired when you come here, all of the students, and we hope to hear from all of you one day. Uh, <laughs> we have our youngsters here. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, I just uh, commend you on the work that you're doing and um, I hope you'll come back mm -hmm. again, um, not just once a year, but we'd love to hear from you again. And thank you for coming on a school night, right? <laughs> a school night. Uh, and you're welcome to stay as long as you wish. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Before we take a seat, we actually have a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for all of you. move to uh, Dr. Watts. Uh, we'll be providing a report on the professional growth he experienced as a result of his participation in the Broad Academy 2018-19 cohort. He will also report on his recent participation with Leading Ed Solutions, an innovative professional learning community comprised of superintendents from across the nation that discuss common challenges and engage in collaborative solutions-based and results-oriented discussions. Dr. Watts. Thank you again, President Vengadaslan, members of the board, Ms. Halley, and our outstanding student leaders. We appreciate their work and know that it is uh, not taken for granted that their success is our success. And I would also like to thank uh, our adults who are ensuring that our young people are becoming better people as a result. Speaking of becoming better, uh, the work that we uh, envision and execute on a daily basis in our learning environments is about learning. We are a learning organization. And it doesn't stop uh, as children uh, continue through their K through 12 experience. Uh, it also includes our adults. And I had an opportunity, uh, really a once in a lifetime opportunity, and I want to also pay my respects and, and gratitude to our board uh, for approving and uh, providing this opportunity for me to be a part of the 
cohort of the Broder Academy, whose three core values are similar to Kent School District's equity, excellence, and impact, uh, with the emphasis on sustainability. So as we begin, uh, a year and a half of meeting with 20 other members who served uh, in various roles from superintendents to assistant superintendents to charter management organizational, organizational leaders from all parts of the country from as far west as Washington State, as far east as New York, Pennsylvania, and as far south as Texas and Georgia. Two key phrases that were a part of this work had to do with uh, equity and equality. Two words that look very similar and oftentimes are understood to be the same. But the reality is part of our work as equity leaders is to ensure that in education, equity is achieved when all students receive the resources they need, most importantly, when they need it. So they graduate prepared for success beyond high school. That is our mission. Equality, on the other hand, does have its place. But equality in education is achieved when students are all treated the same and have access to similar resources. Now, when I say equality has its place, there is a standard that we set for all of our students. It does not mean that each student will arrive at that standard at the same time or at the same place or the same way. And that's where equity uh, work comes in. And that's why equity work is so challenging. We began our uh, journey as uh, leaders in this work by telling our own leadership story. And if I were to say how important it is for each one of us as leaders, because we are all leaders, first to know ourselves, then to know our job, our work, and also to know our people, the people we support, the people who we are supported by. So my first opportunity was to share my leadership story because no matter where I go, no matter where you go, there we are. This is an actual presentation which shared specifically places that I've lived, places, uh, people who, whom I love. Now, I had a limited uh, amount of, of space and so my home family is there. Of course, my work family uh, certainly could be very well represented in this. Uh, foods I love to eat, uh, how I spend time when I'm not at work. Uh, and what are some of my favorite things? The reason why leadership story is so important is that we oftentimes look at our students or the adults who serve them as reflective of only their role and forget that we are all people, that we have stories, we are shaped by our own experiences. The team that I have the opportunity to work with, and this was uh, a very important segment of our work in the Broad Academy was understanding that, that none of us can do this work by ourselves. In fact, we're not supposed to. To lead with a team means that we must ensure that we develop strong relationships with each and every individual whom we're uh, aligned and assigned to serve. Patrick Lencioni wrote one of his more famous uh, works called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and that fable focuses on five key phrases, trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and results. And what Patrick Lencioni uh, states is that the absence of trust, the fear of conflict, the lack of commitment, the avoidance of accountability, and the inattention to results are all signs and reflections of a dysfunctional team or in this case, uh, an or dysfunctional organization. When any team, knowing that, and what he does not say is, underneath trust, what you don't see is a word where trust cannot occur without, and that's communication. We know that communication is one of the most challenging uh, components of leadership. Sometimes the illusion that it actually happens. When we communicate effectively, when I know you, when I know what you think, I can trust you. When I trust you, to the extent that I trust you, I can manage conflict effectively because we often say we don't want conflict in a relationship. Well, I'm sorry, guess what? That's impossible. There is, if you don't have conflict, you don't have a relationship. 
But what Patrick Lencioni says is that the ability to manage conflict effectively is a sign of a functional relationship. When you can manage conflict effectively, you then can show a commitment to the work that's in front of us. When you are committed to the work and you're willing to put the time and effort in, you then understand that you're accountable. You care what happens. When you set a goal and you achieve it, you care what happens. When you set a goal and you don't achieve it, you also care what happens and you work to improve, just as I shared earlier today. And at the end of the day, the top of this pyramid or this triangle is results. Now, no matter what, I've said this before and I believe this, if we do nothing, results will show up. Our goal is to make sure that the desired results are the results that show up. When we are a functional team, we pay attention to those results and we work to maintain or sustain those. One assessment that we were required to, uh, to take is the Lencioni uh, assessment based on those key phrases that I shared with you. The Likert scale of one to five, five meaning always, one meaning never. These scores were actual representation of our team's uh, assessment. The results score at 3.94, for example, this signifies or indicates that our team values collective outcomes more than individual recognition and attainment. Accountability, 3.5. Our score in, in this area is medium, which indicates that our team may be hesitating to confront one another about performance and behavioral concerns. You know, having those tough conversations, those are always hard and they're always necessary. Commitment. 3.86, score in this area is high, which indicates that our team is able to buy into clear decisions, leaving little room for ambiguity or second guessing. Is this the work that needs to be done? Yes or no, and here's why. Conflict, the score indicates that our team is comfortable engaging in unfiltered discussion around important topics. And finally, trust, your score in this area indicates our team may need to get more comfortable being vulnerable letting people know exactly what we're feeling and not being ashamed of, sh of sharing what is on our mind. To be open with one another about individual strengths, weaknesses, mistakes, and needs for help. And what we all know, or we should understand, is that each one of us is in need of help. We can't do this work by ourselves. We often spoke about the allocation of resources, whether it be budgeting or whether it be allocation of time, allocation of people, or allocation of information. In one project that uh, was impacted by this work as a uh, Broad Fellow uh, was how we share information regarding the state of our district. First of all, changing the name from state of the district to state of our district denotes ownership, that we are all in this together. So we see that our graduation rates, while I take no comfort in the fact that until we reach 100%, that we still have work to do, but we have reached historically high gains and are maintaining that rate around the 83, 82% uh, percentage, which indicates also that about 16 to 17% of our students are still not having their needs addressed. But what's important about this change in communication is that typically uh, I or other leaders would share this information to what we call our usual suspects, our community-based organizations who provide opportunities for us to come in and share this information on a slide deck or a PowerPoint. Through this uh, opportunity, we've used social media and we're able to uh, share broadly and widely with constituents uh, across our broad community of 72 square miles and of course, as wide as the internet would allow us to. This is an example of the results that occurred. Increased uh, viewership on social media platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, an increased social response, and this is but the beginning of our ability to uh, reach a broader audience, and we look forward to our work with, within communication to public affairs and all of our communities and teams. So what does it mean when we say equitable allocation of resources? Rem remember, equity, what I need, when I need it, what our students need, what our staff needs, when they need it. And, and that's what we, we often have to, to grapple with, the difference between need and want. 
And sometimes that's hard to, to, to discern. We know that our students are going to be more successful when they are literate, both in reading, in writing, and in math. So opportunities that I was responsible for within this, uh, this fellowship, one is to shadow a Kent School District student, to understand a day in the life of a student. And this particular student happened to be uh, not only a high school student within our comprehensive high school, but also a running start student. To review Kent School District student work samples, oftentimes we don't take time to see how and to what degree we are providing rigorous or relevant or high cognitive demand opportunities when we say learning activities or homework. What does that mean and what should that mean for our students as we continue to learn? Because learning does not stop nor start when the bell rings. Learning is continuous. I was uh, able to conduct student empathy interviews with students from some of our comprehensive high schools as well as students who are enrolled in our iGrad program, essentially working towards empathy, which is meeting students in this case, but meeting others where they are and trying to the extent that we can walk in their shoes. To minimize variance in our curriculum assessment and instruction, that is a guaranteed viable curriculum, meaning no matter where our students are enrolled, kindergarten through 12th grade, our students should be able to know and do what we expect for them. And here's what we do know. When a family member or a student moves within a typical school district, by and large, they don't move outside of the school district. Generally, they move between five and 10 square miles from their original school which means if I move, little Calvin moves to another school, I should not have a very different uh, learning experience based on the standards of instruction. One of our examples of Plan, Do, Study, Act, which is an instructional model that focuses on continuous improvement. These are guidelines, strategies, which uh, are based on our own instructional practices to plan a lesson, to plan, to learn, to do, to teach, or to execute as a student. To study, that means to assess, did it work? Similar to what we do as scientists in an experiment. And then based on what we've learned, we act again. And that becomes a continuous cycle of improvement. And then to increase reliability. The reliability that when this happens, we are certain that the results that we expect will show up. That all students will learn. Each and every student will learn at high levels, regardless of where they attend school. This is the term that was used in our, our fellowship called a high quality seat. What we know today is that sometimes students have a uh, more advantageous experience depending on where they live or how much money their family has in their bank account or uh, which school they attend. Our goal is to make sure we're minimizing that variance and increasing reliability no matter where our students are attending school. This is an example of the notes that I took an observation matrix, as I shared, uh, observing a student both in a high school and in a community college course. These are examples of how our work impacts policy. This goes to the first slide, equity, excellence, most importantly, impact. 150 years of service to our students and families we are celebrating this year in Kent School District. We're 150 years old. None of us were here 150 years ago. And unless something changes drastically in science, none of us will be here 150 years from now. But what we can say is that some of the decisions, the recommendations, the outstanding leadership that's taking place at all levels that we heard today, evidence of that work will and should be evident 150 years from now. Policy is part of that work. How do we ensure that there is impact long after uh, we are serving in these roles? Our Equity Council, our board policy 1801, supports the need for race and equity to ensure that each and every student has what they need when they need it. This policy was adopted in March of 2017. We're continuing to refine this work by increasing the support from our Equity Council. Some leaders who are in this room today are supporting this work uh, as well alongside uh, leaders within this room. One area that we uh, took great pride in was also the notion of design thinking. I wish I could say that we have all the answers to every problem that we need to solve. We don't. 
one way we can get closer to determining what those answers are is if we uh, impact uh, our thinking through what is called design thinking. It's a way of asking ourselves questions in a very different way to move the brain into creativity mode. We had experiences not only with design thinking, but also with improvisation as we would as actors, getting out of our true selves. This is where this work impacted our work in Kent. So how might we, as we recognize and realize where we were presently struggling or falling short in addressing the needs of our children, creating an environment where all students, each and every, family, staff, community members, felt safe, safe physically, safe socially, emotionally, respected, valued for their diverse life experiences, their language, their culture, their values, and their beliefs. It's one of our action learning projects in Kent School District where we are focusing on creating a welcoming environment for each and every family within Kent School District. Decreasing disproportionality in school discipline, specifically out of school suspensions and expulsions, and if you've paid any attention to the work that is taking place and discussions that have taken place at the dais, or you've looked at our data in our schools, I take no comfort. While we have seen some improvements, I also know that we have some predictability based on uh, our students and their, uh, the rate at which our students, uh, in many cases, are being remanded uh, based on behaviors. And in our uh, reality in Kent School District, uh, a student who happens to be uh, male and happens to be black or brown uh, is uh, sometimes twice or three times uh, more likely to be suspended or expelled. When our equity work, particularly our race and equity work, is working well, we will no longer be able to use those data as predictors for success of our students or non-success. And thirdly, to provide each and every student with equitable access to high quality learning environment support systems, facilities, which we uh, discussed during our, our work session today and other educational resources. And so I leave you with equity or equality. Our mission, successfully preparing all students for their futures. But if I were to ask you to take a look at that mission statement and ask yourself which word jumps out, which word means something to you, and each time I read it, there's another word that jumps out at me differently. The same with our vision. As a school district, our vision is to produce graduates who are globally competitive learners and through equitable access to high quality, academic, social, and applied learning, students will not just be prepared, they'll be ready to excel in college, careers, and in life. And the work in the Broad Academy has uh, enabled us to truly uh, fine tune what our vision work really needs to be. Again, I thank you for the opportunity uh, it was a, uh, a life-changing year and a half, and the work is just beginning. Uh, but at this time, I'll stand ready to respond to any questions that you have at this time. So what would you say is your one takeaway that you're bringing back to the district, um, something that you would do differently from the work that you've done in the Broad Academy? So it's context is everything. And if I were to go back uh, four and a half years, we began having conversations about performance management and theory of action. Uh, managed performance empowerment is a theory of action that says we have change that needs to take place. When I'm performing well, I should gain some level of flexibility. When I'm not performing to standard, I should have some form of management uh, that helps me, supports uh, so that I can actually achieve at higher levels. And what I realized is that in some cases, uh, we have, whether it's some students or some of our schools or some of our teams or some of our district support staff, where we are actually giving flexibility without accountability. When we, we don't see the results that we desire, and yet we're not making all of the changes and adjustments that we need. Uh, and we need to create a system that will allow us to do so. And that is what uh, a theory of action in this case, manage performance empowerment as an example, uh, would help us do. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, so I am thinking about um, 
Oh, I was looking at your vision statement. You were talking about words that jumped out. Um, and I thought about, you know, I think it's one thing to provide access. I think it's another to ensure students are successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that is where sometimes it, it gets lost because, um, you know, we give students access to um, all of these higher level classes and, and support and, and well, higher level classes and, um, you know, AP and, but um, in particular, if those students don't have that, histor that history, um, they struggle. And sometimes we can do worse because if they feel as though they're failing, um, and the staff is not prepared to support them, um, it can be a step farther backwards. So I just, I think about, you know, it's one thing to have access, but it's also, I think it's more important to make sure that there are support systems in place to make sure that it is truly equitable um, for their success. Um, another question I have, and, and it's kind of a, something I've struggled with a little bit because I know the work that has happened around the race and equity policy and one of the things that I feel is lacking is that, um, you know, I think it's important as a district moving forward in this work to have um, all stakeholders involved. And I think that there has been a lack of ability for the board to participate. I know I've asked a couple of times about participating on, you know, the equity committee and things like that. And so I think that um, you're missing an opportunity to truly have the impact of everyone in the district when the board is not allowed to or not encouraged to participate in this work and particularly when you have some board members who um, are very versed in this work and do this work so um, I would just ask that that's something that um, you know you reconsider moving forward to help because the reality is the board you know we approve the policies and we support that and so we um, the work is just as important for us to be involved in I believe um, as anyone else, and so, and um, you know, as pa as a parent, um, as a community member, I think that is just uh, it's just something that I think really needs to change. So, that's all. thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I too want to echo that. Um, what Director Daniel said. Um, I think uh, we've sort of been in the background, and we were told if it's a district initiated committee that board members usually don't participate until the decision comes to the dais and I, I think that's um, I don't know historically that's never been the case and so I'm not quite sure how that happened but um, I do think it would be important for us to participate and hear from staff in our community as well um, but I, I, I do see, Dr. Watts, I do see us evolving. Um, I think any professional development helps us become better as a district. And so I just, um, I think, you know, it would be important for us to make sure that we're incorporating what we learn in, into our practices. Um, and I thank you for sharing because I know that's been a big question mark for the community about what is happening with all this professional development and um, it's really important to report out. Um, I, I do the same thing at work. I ask people whenever they go for a conference, make sure there's a report out. You know, we have to hold each other accountable of what we're learning and how we're using that learning in our schools. So thank you so much for that. You're very welcome. Thank you. Question, I guess. Um, you referred to action learning project. How many do we have going, and are they all a result of what you've been learning at Broad? So we have three that are currently in place, and uh, while the action learning projects are not the actual topics, are not a necessarily a result of what is taking place in my learning. Uh, they are what are what I refer to as the three greatest levers to improving student outcomes and based on our data review, our data show exactly what, uh, what we've discussed, that we have uh, examples of environments that may not feel as welcoming for each and every community member, staff, student member. Uh, we have data that show we have disproportionate discipline rates that are occurring for some of our students and we have data that show that we have students who may not have access to high quality learning opportunities and I appreciate that Director Daniels your uh, your comments are duly noted about uh, rigor or cognitive demand from a programmatic standpoint 
and I also want to to offer another way of looking, which I've shared because that is you're you're ab absolutely correct. Uh, it is not just about uh, advanced placement or college and high school or any other program that provides an, an enriching experience. It's also that opportunity for the student who is two grade levels below in, in readability and and I only have 180 days in a school school year. Cognitive demand also says I need to accelerate little Calvin's readability and literacy 240 or 360 days within 180 days of instruction. And that can be done if it's done uh, with the uh, equity and uh, uh, the high quality learning experiences that take place. And so it's a broad an experience for what reaching each and every one of our students means, but I appreciate your bringing that uh, to my attention and, and to our community's attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Right. We are moving to our 4.03 2019-20 budget update. Ben Rarick, Executive Director of Budget and Finance, and Supervisor Lisa Tyler will present the 2019-20 General Fund Fiscal Information and answer questions from the board. Is Lisa here? Good evening. Good to see you. Um, so I have a lot of information for you. <laughs> um, and I'm cognizant of the fact that this could go very long, so I'm not going to, I'm going to try to get through some of this material and then if you just need to ask questions, that's fine, but just, I'm, I'm looking at three pretty big chunks of information here, and I'm trying to do kind of meeting management here. So um, you could guide me one way or the other, choose you want to go back and ask questions about something, okay? Um, I'm um, pleased to be here this evening to talk to you about three chunks of information. Uh, the first chunk pertains to this year, so we're looking at the financial statement and the preliminary numbers for September of this year. It's so early, frankly, that um, there's a lot of anomalies in that data that I, I you know, I'm going to spend a brief amount of time on the September numbers. By the next time we get together, we'll have, you know, more than one month of information. Um, and so that'll be a pretty brief conversation unless you want to get into that more. Um, so that includes both the statement and the normal budget status update document that you're accustomed to. And then I also have for you um, the preliminary um, F196. Um, a letter associated with that F-196 and the F-196 data that has been put in the budget status update format as you have become accustomed to. So that F-196 document's pre-technical, so I'll focus on the PowerPoint version of it. And then later on as part of six, there's a certification special levy which I will uh, address briefly as part of this, but then uh, we'll leave that to the agenda item. So. First of all, I don't know if you remember this, but I think it was almost two years to the date where we were here doing this presentation in front of a packed audience. And we talked about a vision for being a best practice district um, and uh, culminating in a full fiscal recovery, and that drew some laughter. And I'm really proud to say that I think at this point, I, I, I'm in a position to be able to give you some news that's genuinely hard data and good news in terms of we're no longer 
the district that um, had two consecutive years of negative fund balance. We're no longer the district that couldn't meet general fund payroll. Uh, we're no longer the district that had among the lowest bond ratings, but rather we are a district that people are, are starting to talk about. And I think you heard the text of the, uh, of the, the uh, credit rating, the bond rating, um, and our uh, financial advisor says, you know, I got to tell you, I've never read a, a bond rating press release like that, and I've never had a, a credit call like that. So um, it's it's heartening to be part of this turnaround. Um, I wouldn't say we're fully 100% there, but we're absolutely further along than I would expect. And so given that, let me first talk to you about um, current year data, which I will go through fairly quickly at the indulgence of the board. Again, we're talking about one month's data at this point. We typically don't start getting into current year until we've closed prior year, right? Um, and what you're gonna see here is that, again, on the revenue side, when you're talking about one month, you don't spend a lot of time looking at the percentages until things start to stabilize, but there's nothing here that jumps out as extremely <coughs> unusual. The expenditure data tends to be a little more normal because we have payroll, right? Payrolls tend to be, and so right now at a target of 8.3%, which is just a month of the year, we're well within that number for you know one month. Um, by object, again, I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the anomalies, but again, at 6.54%, we're certainly within the target of one month. Year-to-year -year change in revenue um, is down just slightly, but it's down because we're seeing, again, some anomalous differences in state special and state federal, and um, I expect that that's due to a month and not you know, an extended pattern, so uh, with a couple more months data, we'll be able to explain that. Um, and then on the, on the expenditure side by object, um, there's some data here that is interesting that I think is worth looking at when you're starting to look at payroll. So we're up 8.77% in the two, three, and 4,000 series, the object codes. Um, I expect that to go up because we're not seeing the impact of SEB yet, right? Um, but for most of the contracts, um, our staffing, et cetera, you would expect that to all be reflected. Uh, MSOC is not going to be normal at this point uh, as October is, 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 or excuse me, September is atypical in a number of ways. Okay. So here's where I can provide some, some updated information and um, I think we'll change the way you see this slide. So this shows us the budgeted to actual on enrollment and I think I sent you all an update on how we were doing in that first week, right? And we were looking at budgeted by grade span and then actual by grade span. Um, and so this reflects for September. Um, but I have November data and it's noteworthy because we've really turned actually in, in a way that's not part of the normal curve for a year. So we're actually up 129 students um, relative to the prior year November. So looking at this year November count date, last year November count date, um, we're up 129. So you can see we were down 37. So that is, you know, a material change. So something is happening in our community there, although we still tend to see um, that it, we're, we're down at the high school and elementary schools and that the middle schools tend to be uh, a little up. Okay. So um, that's probably a about as much as I want to get into for September for now, because I think what you really want to hear about is prior year. And so with the board's indulgence, can I move to the um, other PowerPoint at this time? Okay.
sorry to make you. <laughs> Okay, so this is year end 2018 19, and you have both the technical document um, and then the budget status version. So let's, um, for, the, for the user friendly version, let's, let's uh, focus on the budget status. Okay, same format as you have typically been accustomed. Um, this was a very interesting year and a totally atypical year. So keep that in mind. Remember our analogy about our, our bike race. Do you remember that? Then you went over one, one hill and another one's coming, right? But we knew that this year was a kind of a, a carve out year where we were gonna get the benefit of an additional half year of levy and that was not the permanent go forward situation, right? And so we're really seeing uh, to a great extent the reflection of that and also, secondly, and I, I want this to register with you because it's the one thing that is a real takeaway. The spend behavior this year was truly anomalous to any prior year in Kent, and I'll show you that. Um, so the takeaway on the revenue slide is we hit revenue almost right on. So there was no unanticipated necessarily on the revenue side. We were at 99.4% of what we anticipated on revenue. Not true on the spend side. So you can see on the bottom right that, you know, typically, at least in 17, 18, we were over 98% of budgeted capacity in terms of expend. This year, we were 93.9%. That's a big difference when you're talking about a budget of this magnitude, okay? So when you're looking at the budgeted fund balance in terms of what actually materialized, there it is, is, is the degree of underspend on uh, appropriated bu budget authority, okay? Um, there's a couple little, oh, I'll hold on that for next slide, okay? This is just a representation of that spend by object. Again, major difference in the amount of the budget that was spent in aggregate. And then you can see it by, by object series. Okay. Then, uh, sorry. This. Go back. Back. This one. Okay. This says what we think it should say, right? We. This tells the story that we foresaw, which is a more revenue, b less local revenue, c more state revenue. All three things were true, and all three things were true in almost the proportions that we foresaw. Okay, so that's revenue year to year at 14.9%, okay. This is just the activity through August on the spend side by object. The reason you see the large increase in capital outlay, remember we've been having this conversation, why do we see 294% increase? It's just that we basically, the, this, the, the second year of our negative fund balance, people, you couldn't buy capital outlay. Like it was just, we had budget for it, but we, we didn't expend that line because of the, the austerity measures necessary at that time, okay? And so this slide, actually, you need a little bit more information here that I want to give you. Okay. You have total fund balance, you have, and then you have unassigned fund balance, right? So your policy, <coughs> policy 6002, says that if the district is gonna comply with its own policies, which thank goodness we are finally doing, that the district will maintain an unassigned fund balance of 5% of prior year expenditure, okay? That number would be $18.1 million, okay? And the truly unassigned, the truly unassigned fund balance in this fund balance is $20.3 million. You don't actually see that number, but it's 890 and 891 added together. Okay, and I'm on slide eight. Okay. The difference is restricted fund balance and assigned fund balance. 
okay? Restrictions are for things that law requires be restricted, okay? Either law, policy, um, and so, um, and then assignments are at the discretion of the board. Now, I do want to, although you don't see it listed here because this is not necessarily the, form, but the format for it, one, the most significant assignment of fund balance is $5 million for the anticipated expense associated with complying with the 24 credit graduation requirement and the redesign of the secondary school landscape. And so we know that that is going to be a significant expense for the district. The district has not landed on a specific model yet. So you don't see 6.132, there's not a specific scientific number that is associated with a specific model, but we know regardless of which model we choose, with perhaps one exception, that this is gonna be a major financial commitment of the district in the out years. And so that is why it shows as, reflects as an assigned fund balance. But, but even at that, you still exceed policy 6002 requirements um, by over $2 million, okay? This slide here, um, so you're looking at the kind of charcoal color line, right? And you can see the line is just a fundamentally different line than in any previous year. Um, and so that is a combination of two things. One, obviously we experienced higher revenue, but spending at 93% of budget meant that we were, the, the, just the total, the trajectory of this, of this line is just fundamentally different than in any prior year because as you're going through the year, you're actually accumulating fund balance each month in a way that we were not doing in any previous year. So the story of this year really is that 93.9% .9 on the expenditure side. This is not a revenue story in terms of budget. And so um, that is the The overall place that, w that this puts us in is, I think, a great one. A, we're compliant with board policy 6002. Um, we know that next year doesn't look like this year in either sense, but now we're positioned uh, to be able to ride that out in a way that we're not, um, we're not hanging on an edge as we were in prior years. Um, and so certainly the notion of any interfund loan um, declining credit ratings, all that is certainly well behind us at this point. And I really feel very good about where we're at. And I can say with some confidence that we actually compare, we're certainly not th the best, but we now kind of compare reasonably with our peer districts in the region. We're not, we're not an outlier in the way that we were for two consecutive fiscal years. I mean, at one point we were getting letters from community members suggesting that, you know, the district be dissolved for financial, you know, so we've come completely the other direction and, and I'm pleased to be able to report that today. So happy to take any questions. Now, there is one more document in there. It is a letter to OSPI. Um, Dr. Watts showed a pyramid up there. One of the, uh, this, the, uh, the layers was accountability. So this is something I need to be accountable for. I'm gonna disclose it to you today. It's not a serious, serious issue, but I want you to be aware of it, okay? Last year, in December, you will recall we sold bonds, right? So we did a budget in August, and then we sold bonds in December, four months after we adopted the budget. The way we structured those bonds, we committed to payments in the current year that, may, that required us to rely on fund balance to fully pay those debts. We exceeded the authority by like 2%, I think it is. You have a letter there. When you do that, now, I think from a materiality standpoint, I don't think it's gonna be an audit finding. It'll probably be an exit item, but we should have come back to you in like June and said, we need you to authorize that additional $700,000 and you would have passed a resolution to do that. We didn't do that and I'm accountable for that, but we have uh, put in place a process now where prior to the June meeting before you go for the summer, we'll get all that ironed out and taken care of so you don't have to worry about that again. Um, that is it for now. I will be coming back up to you for a resolution. 
um, to certify our levy amounts, but I'm happy to take any questions um, on this and then come back on the, on the other item. Sure, I'll start. Um, so, so a slide four that I'm looking at, because you're looking at the, right, it's total expended, I think it's managed by program. Slide four? Yes. Yep. So you got the number, 94% of budget. Yes. Um, there's one kind of blemish, if you will. Hmm? Uh, pupil transportation, 114% yes. of budget. Yes. I know we've talked about that throughout the year. Yes. It ended you have kind of where you thought it would end, about 1.5, 1.6 million over budget. Um, so it's really more, how does that impact next year? There, the there is new year? information there, though. Um, I'm glad you raised it, and it was one of my notes. In, to be totally fair to pupil transportation, um, in the middle of the year, we, depending on one's interpretation, either received new guidance or we were made aware of guidance that already existed about how you charge a certain type of pupil tra transportation expense. So we have about a million to a million three of expenses for uh, our inclusive education students that um, that we had previously been charging to um, 2,000 mm -hmm. inclusive ed. And what we were told is that no, all other districts are charging that under pupil transportation. So we moved all of those expenses to be in comportment with that guidance. And so that was an unanticipated expense for pupil transportation, not an unanticipated expense for the whole district, right? So it made it made pupil transportation look like they went over more than than really in the spirit they actually did. Okay. <clears throat> then my next question is actually on the next page. Um, this was more, and you may not have this off the top of your hand. When we think about, are we on five? Uh, yes, okay. slide five. So think about the certificated salaries. It's 96% of budget. Yes. For the most part, that's going to be open positions. And I just kind of want to verify, like, that's what we're thinking. When we think about percent of budget, because we budget for a full head count all year, <coughs> all positions, how much of that is basically truly we just didn't have somebody in a role and mm -hmm. the, we didn't pay them. Yeah. Um, and therefore, you know, that's not really a trend we expect to continue, again, assuming full head count. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not able to answer that question right now. I mean, in spirit, that's going to be true, that certainly vacancies are going to be part of that. I, I don't have any data on me about how much of that it is. Because yeah. I think, just from our standpoint, from a board standpoint, right. the right. total able budgeted to... FTE is there. Uh, that wasn't changed. It's just if you didn't have people hired either Correct. at the beginning Correct. or left throughout the year and hadn't been backfilled. Um, then it obviously creates a variance when we think Correct. about the budget for this year. We're still budgeting full FTE for whatever we had. Correct. Approved. And that that is, it, it, it allows, it's a segue to a, a point I wanted to make here, which is that there were programs that got fairly significant funding increases because the state provided more funding, right? And so we found ourselves in this very odd juncture year where we just finished two consecutive years of negative fund balance, right? But then all of a sudden, these programs, individually, that have restricted funding, needed to grow their programs, right? And that, that, is, a, it, uh, that is an immediate shift in philosophy and mentality in the middle of the year. So I don't expect to see 93% again, right? I think it's, it's somewhat a byproduct of go slow, now go fast in these programs, right? The, right? The, the categorical programs, Correct. Right? we get more funding for categorical Correct. programs, so we have to have the expenses Correct. to get the funding, and so you got to actually If you get extra people. funding for career and technical yeah. education, you're spending it on that program, right? right? Okay, thank you. Yes. That was all my question. No? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the assigned to contingencies. Yes. Um, so I have uh, a list. Those are left blank, I think. But I, I do know departments talk about um, using contingency funds, so how are they factored into a particular budget? Okay. So, um, the, um, there's a variety of different restrictions. Um, Anytime we carry over categorical grants, all of that is restricted for the purpose of that grant, right? That's close to $3 million right there. Um, and higher, quite a bit higher than I anticipated. Um, another example is um, people transportation funding carryover. 
okay, restricted to that program. That's close to 1.6 million. These are the largest restrictions I think we've ever had. Um, the other one, which we've not had before, but I, if you recall, I, we, we did talk about it a bit. Um, so our schools have carryover budgets, right? And we basically, for, for in the time when we were cash poor, we sent the message to districts that we would allow schools to carry over part of their budget to the extent it was unexpended at the end of the year, right? So that accrues as fund balance. But clearly, it's restricted, right? And also, we have now told, we've, we've developed a new procedure whereby schools know that that policy would list continue at the end of next year. So we know that money, you know, the school level carry for a policy was never a permanent policy, right? And so we had a way to get in, and now we got a way to get out. Well, we know that that money, which is approximately $2 million, it's fund balance, but it will not be there in, at the end of next year, you know, it, because schools naturally, they know the policy, they understand the incentive, right? And so it is really a process of identifying, okay, of what is left in the bank account, how much do we know is actually going to hang around? <laughs> and how much um, do we need to tag for a particular purpose. Um, another one is, um, and this is of the assigned nature, in the um, F-196 uh, kind of technical document, um, and I'm not sure if we include it in the version on your board packet, but you certainly it's part of the, um, you know, the final all-encompassing document, is something called a schedule of long-term liabilities, okay? Um, there are some liabilities that districts have that kind of accrue over time that you have to manage beyond a year. One of them is what we call compensated absences. So when we hire an employee and we grant that employee vacation leave and they accumulate that leave over many years, well, that is a cost that is eventually going to come to roost if the district, if the if the person doesn't take that leave and liquidates that. And in fact, that happened to us in 6, 17, 18 when we spent far more than we had reserved for the purposes of compensated absences. So part of assigning uh, the amount that ties to the long-term liabilities is now, okay, let's start to treat this as a true long-term liability rather than budgeting it year to year. And so the state provides guidance on how to calculate that, and there's like three different methods that are acceptable and we chose one, et cetera. Um, but now we actually are assigning fund balance for not the immediate consideration of what it's going to cost, but what it will cost in the future. So are you defining the contingencies as the liabilities? Long just that liability. one. Just that one. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the big one that I think I already mentioned was the, um, the $5 million for um, secondary redesign. There's certainly going to be a robust debate about should it be four, should it be nine, should it be right? So we're trying because we don't know the exact model yet. You can't pin a precise number to it, but we know that it will be structurally part of our financial horizon. So. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Yes. Thank you, ben. Pleasure. Okay. Am I good? <clears throat> okay. Moving on to five point oh, our public hearing, five point oh one is our public hearing on sale of Wickstrom property. We will now receive comments on the sale of real property known as Wickstrom property. Any person wishing to submit written or spoken comments regarding the proposed sale may do so at this time. Are there any comments? Ms. Bettinger. Yes. So I, I drove past the property tonight on my way here. Um, I looked at the map. So my question is, I've heard there's not enough parking at Covington Elementary. Um, I've just been there a couple times hanging posters for the drama program and seeing staff parking across the street at the church. So the concern is, is there enough property you know, if you sell those two parcels, is there enough property if that school needs to expand? 
if there needs to be more parking for students is you know is there already an idea in mind for that property is someone building something where there's going to be parking like ball fields or houses or things like that so my big concern is just parking and it doesn't seem safe to cross that street necessarily on a crosswalk and especially if you're bringing a little one late to school i mean is that what's the cost benefit analysis of selling that property and um, keeping it for for um, parking and or portables or any additional space. So that's my big concern since I've seen it firsthand that there's not enough parking for staff even there. Thank you. All right, um, at this time we are just taking comments and so we'd like to ask for a motion to close the public hearing if there aren't anyone else speaking on it. Um, so I'd like to ask for a motion please to close the hearing. I move that we close the public hearing. All right, is there a second? I'll second. Are there any discussions or questions? Um, calling for a vote. All those in favor, say aye and raise your right hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed, say no and raise your right hand. Okay, the hearing is now closed. Uh, moving to 5.02, public hearing on sale of Hellison property. We will now receive comments on the sale of real property known as the Hellison property. Any person wishing to submit written or spoken comments regarding the proposed sale may do so at this time. Are there any comments? Ms. Bettinger? Yes, already said. Both okay. those properties are useful. Okay. All right. I'd like a motion to close the public hearing on the Hellison property. Calling for a motion, please. I move that we close the public hearing on the Hellison property. All right, is there a second? I'll second. Are there any discussions or questions? All right, I'm calling for a vote. All those in favor, say aye and raise your right hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed, say no and raise your right hand. Okay, the hearing is now closed. All right, we will move to discussion and approval, 6.0 Board of Directors. 6.01, resolution number 1569, <coughs> resolution of racial imbalance. I'd like to ask a board member to make a motion to approve 6.01. I move that we approve 6.01, board of directors, resolution 1569. Is there a second, please? I'll second. All right, uh, are there any... Uh, <coughs> A motion has been made and seconded to approve 6.01. Are there any discussions or questions? All right. Um, all those in favor, say aye and raise your right hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed, say no and raise your right hand. A okay, motion passes. 6.02, resolution number 1570, New Valley Elementary School Educational Specifications. I'd like to ask a board member to make a motion, please, to approve 6.02. I so move that we approve 6.02, resolution 1570. Is there a second? A second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve 6.02, resolution New Valley Elementary School Educational Specifications. Are there any discussions or questions? Clarification point. I know we, we met with the architects earlier this, this evening, um, but this resolution is only regarding the New Valley Elementary School, not the other one that we've been on. That's a great question. Uh, so, what that is is because this is due to the D5 form, which is for OSPI for uh, funding, state funding. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Dave, for the presentation. If um, all of you have not had a chance to watch it, it'll be on video. Um, great presentation of our schools coming up. And uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, call for a vote. All those in favor, say aye and raise your right hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed, say no and raise your right hand. A motion passes. 6.03. Resolution number 1571, certification of special levy. I'd like to ask a board member to make a motion to approve 6.03, please. I so move that we approve 6.03, Resolution 1571. All right. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve Resolution Number 15, 1571, Certification of Special Levy. Are there any discussions or questions?
Hearing none, I will ask, call for a vote. All those in favor, say aye, and raise your right hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed, say no, and raise your right hand. The okay, motion passes. 6.04, resolution. Dr. Harmon asked me to explain one thing about this to get it on the record. Is, is it okay if I know you've just voted on it, but uh, wanted to explain one aspect so there's no confusion about something? Okay. So this is, you're, you're familiar with this form and how we do this every fall, which is, I know why you just passed it. The one thing we do need to get on the record is our property values have been growing far more than we have anticipated. This appears to be just a, a, a Kent phenomenon. Everybody's growing, but Kent's really growing. The effect of that is that our actual effective tax rate from these amounts goes down, right? You're raising a fixed amount, but property's worth more. The actual tax rate is lower, right? So we will be amending some of these materials that you have been seeing for the levy that talk about the, fl the flat tax rate, right? I think the rate that you've been seeing is like the combined 389 rate, 388, 389. That rate is now 383. And so when you see that, that is not an error, right? That's not a mistake or anything. That is just reflecting the new county assessed value. And we won't know the true, true, true value, of course, until we actually get into the collection calendar year. So you will see those materials going out later this week um, with the amended lower tax rate as a function of this resolution. Thank you, Ben. <coughs> yes, we did. 6.04. <laughs> <laughs> resolution number 1572, newly elected school directors authorized to attend Washington State School Directors Association annual <coughs> conference. Uh, action required. Uh, I'd like to ask a board member to make a motion to approve resolution number 1572. I so move that we approve resolution 1572. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, a motion has been made and seconded to approve resolution number 1572. Uh, <clears throat> are there any discussions or questions? And I'd just like to make a comment. I think this is a great opportunity for um, our newly elected officials to be able to attend it. I hope they will all take advantage of it. So, yeah. so make the same comment. If they take advantage, we also have two officer positions that will be opening up, and so it's a chance to learn more specific about the officer positions in addition to being a board member, as well as kind of compare the needs of Kent, which is a relatively large school district compared to everybody else that will meet at the WASTA uh, conference, and then compare the needs of what we have to the, to the others in the other districts. Well, it will actually be three officer three positions because there will be full elections yeah. at the beginning of the term. Based on her right. All right. Of, yeah. 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 I've got my own <laughs> position. So yes, all observations. <laughs> <laughs> and all three have expressed interest. So that's great. All right. Um, calling for a vote. All those in favor, say aye and raise your right hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed, say no and raise your right hand. Okay. Motion passes. 7.0. Consent agenda. <coughs> Would anyone like to pull an agenda item up for discussion? All right, I'd like a board member to make a motion to approve our consent agenda. I move that we approve the consent agenda. All right, is there a second? I have a second. Motion has been made <clears throat> to approve, and seconded to approve our consent agenda. Are there any discussions or questions? Hearing none, I'd like to call for a vote. All those in favor say aye and raise your right hand. Aye. 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 All those opposed say no and raise your right hand. The motion passes. 8.0 informational is the Follett Destiny Library Manager. And as a reminder, this is informational. We do not take a vote. Are there any questions or comments? We just wanted to share with the board, we've been having a um, long-standing conversation about our library systems and how we're cataloging those materials. Um, and in that transition to the system of moving to Follett, um, the original invoice from the vendor did not include tax. Mm -hmm. We are required to pay tax. 
Um, as a general rule of thumb, I would say that that's 10% um, and would bring that to the board as an awareness. So that's part of the, the biggest part of the cost difference between our May bringing this to you and now. Um, and then the other was an additional $1,000 because we had to add one additional site. Um, I believe it was Kent Valley Early Learning Center. And so that combined covers um, that price difference. Um, and I have the invoice if you'd like to see that they just didn't charge us tax. So we have to pay that and then the additional $1,000. So that's why I'm just bringing it to your awareness. So it's full authority. Uh, mm -hmm. I did have a question on the Amico Craig scholarship. Um, oh, okay. Uh, this was, I, I believe these awards are, I saw that it is being administered or as a partnership we're working with um, Kent Community Foundation. So I just wanted to make sure because I thought we had originally said that they would administer the scholarships. So that course. is an interesting and fascinating, oh. I can talk about the technical side and then you can talk about, okay. So it's an interesting and fascinating process with that. So although the, the monies were donated to Kent School District um, and the amount of $100,000, um, because they were donated directly to us, um, we can't release that authority and until those monies are spent down. So it's kind of like we are the fiscal agent for the scholarship. And so all of the scholarship practices, processes, awards, and those kinds of things will happen through the Kent um, Schools Foundation. Um, and then we basically cut the checks to ensure that that's done. Yeah, I understood that okay. part. I was questioning, um, did we not agree that, or the foundation agree that uh, the scholarships would be handled by the Kent Community Foundation and not the Kent Schools Foundation. Who do you want to talk about? Okay. So yes, the vehicle will be used um, through the wonderful partnership of the Kent Community Foundation. So our students can do one application through their website and apply for all of the scholarships through our local service clubs that use that um, and the many scholarship opportunities that are available. Um, so we're still working out the technical details with them and getting the application up through there. Um, there are many scholarship opportunities. That partnership was just forged last year, as you know, um, and available to our students so that they can do one one application instead of many, um, but we do plan to partner with them and um, the Kent Schools Foundation Board is working on that process. Okay. So. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. All right, any other questions? Okay, we are up to our 9.0 communications. Thank you all for waiting. Um, we will start with students, but I'm not sure if they're all still here, so we'll start. Uh, Clemente Garcia. All right. Moses Sullivan. If you'd like to come up to the podium. And as a reminder, uh, we are uh, listening for our understanding. We do not usually comment during this time. And you'll have three minutes to speak, please. Okay. So what I want to say here is that um, through my experience, I feel unfulfilled with the language opportunities for that I get in my school. And so as I went through school and looked through all the available language courses through the four years that I've been in high school, it's only been the same languages. and. I've tried various languages out, such as ASL or Spanish, but it never hit it for me. Um, it, it just seems like a very narrow and um, limited language opportunity for me to learn at school. And so, sadly, I, I just decided not to take a language this year, which Language is one of my favorite things to learn, but I just do not um, appreciate the languages that I have available to me. Um, I have some understanding on why the choices are limited. However, I'm questioning whether or not these reasons that have been relayed to me are current or up to date for today. Like maybe a long time ago, people were stopped 
getting interested in, say, the German language, but if there was a way to take, like, a census or something to um, know how many people are actually interested in all these other languages besides Spanish or French or Japanese, all very good languages, just not my language, not anything that interests me or really works for me. Um, at my school, I had a really, I have a really cool teacher who I actually got into a pretty in-depth conversation about the languages that um, would be really cool to learn, but um, these languages just aren't available anymore. Some used to be available, not anymore. Some were never. Um, it, it's just my wish that there was more available classes to learn a um, second language than English. Thank you. Thank you very much. Spedinger, uh, 9.01. Well, I was hoping I didn't have to speak because I had a lot of questions that I sent to you about this um, meeting. There's like the consent agenda. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, si at least six items that didn't have any public um, documents to view, like contracts and things like that. If you look at the vouchers, you know, we paid 15000 to an uh, educational consultant on 1031 for PD, PD, and there's no contract I can find anywhere in board docs. We paid 43 k to Elevation Healthcare. No contract I can find in board docs. So when I look at the budget, some of these things really concern me, and the public doesn't have an opportunity to see them. Um, 7.19 on the consent agenda, superintendent travel. It seems to be missing information. Superintendent's requesting personal time to attend, to speak at a keynote, uh, uh, speak a keynote address. So there's no information on how many personal days have already been taken. There's no information on if he's receiving compensation. Um, if he is, his contract requires that to be paid to the district. So. The um, consent agenda, I believe, should have that information so the public is aware. Um, the Northwood Middle School intercom system upgrade, 72K. There's no purchase order. It doesn't outline the scope of work. There's no copy of the original contract. Um, so I just, I'm really disappointed that this information isn't available to the public. And, you know, the public has the right to see this, especially when. They're concerned about money. So thank you. Um, Jessica Robinson. Okay, so I did Kentwood High School, and my concern, well, uh, majority of people's concern would be um, the issue revolving around cutting programs from our school. Um, I and other many other students have felt that we should be able to do something. So our concern would be, what can we do to save our school programs, like our music and things like that? Thank you. Morgan Vermeer. Morgan? No. Oh. Hello, I'm currently a senior at Kentwood High School. And I'm here to talk about um, classes that prepare us for life after high school. Um, currently, I haven't heard about any of these classes until this year, which was kind of shocking just because of how useful these classes are supposed to be for us because we're graduating and we're supposed to be able to do like life on our own. But I've never heard about these classes until this year, so I feel like we need a better way to communicate like what classes we're currently taking and like just a better way to communicate the different classes that our, each of our schools offer to especially like incoming people, freshmen and sophomores, just so they can get a head start and start taking those classes sooner and learn more. Just because since I'm a senior, I have to take all of these classes 
required to graduate and I can't really take the classes that I particularly like want to or need right now just because I wish I could have like gone back and like known more about these classes sooner. Thank you. Thank you. Abby Kidwell. Oh, hi, my name is Abigail Kidwell. Uh, I'm a senior at Kentwood. Although I believe our current security is doing a great job, um, I think that two security guards for about like 2,000 kids that attend Kentwood High School is just not enough. Um, I ask for more security and um, <clears throat> but like because with more and more like school shootings arising these days, I don't think that one security guard is just enough to defend a thousand students. I want to ensure that my peers and myself feel safe while attending school. I understand there's only so much that can be done. But that is all. Thank you. Terrence Grahante. Oh, Terrence or oh, Terrace. All right. Well, we thank you, all students who stayed so late. Uh, to speak to us. Okay, uh, Ray Lee, Mr. Lee. Followed by Ron Howell, Manuel Cardenas, and Siante Grant. Good evening, school board, Dr. Watts. Um, <clears throat> I uh, received a uh, last minute call tonight. Um, I had, this was not on my calendar. I had something else that I was planning on doing tonight, but um, received a last minute call um, from someone requesting some help. And I do a lot of help in the community. So I dropped what I had planned to do and um, came to, um, try to assist this gentleman. Um, he was here earlier. Um, he was informed that um, because of his current situation, um, as a, uh, he is an employee of the district, but because of his current situation with the district, he is not allowed to be on school property at this time. So he was asked to leave, and he was asked very nicely to leave. So I would like to thank um, I've been sitting here all night and I can't remember um, Tim, Tim, yeah. Um, Tim worked with us um, uh, very well tonight, but uh, the gentleman was asked to leave. So um, I'd like to read the letter that he was going to read and then I have a few comments afterwards. Um, dear members of the board, and this is verbatim what, he, uh, what he's typed up here. Dear members of the board, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Ron Howell, and I have been up until recently a security guard and creator of coordinator of mentorship programs at Camp Meridian High School. Please forgive my emotion as I speak to you this evening. I have recently been wrongfully terminated from this position, and it grieves my heart greatly. Empowering these kids and serving my community is what my life is all about. And it is not easy coming before you today seeking help. This was a situation that occurred this summer in which bulleted our, H, our human resource is asking me to take responsibility for another adult and his actions. No law enforcement has been involved. The facts I shared are being manipulated and the manipulated facts don't add up to termination. I am at a complete loss as to why I am here before you and not in my job at KM. I had great uh, bulleted. I had great reviews in my role as a security officer at Kemp Meridian. I come from the same background as the students I serve. I long to give back to my community and build into these students. I developed men's mentorship groups for KM male students identified as at risk 
investing in interest and care, giving them the connection to school, linking them with school, <coughs> and a couple of other bullets that items. I hear the timer going off. I'll finish, wrap up. I have done nothing that violates my ability to work with these kids and serve my community. I do such good things for the Kent School District, Kent Meridian High School, and our students. Please, I am here to ask you to look into my situation. Help me to get back to serving our students. I am asking you to please do not approve my termination until further investigation. So I briefly had just um, a few minutes to talk to this young man before he was asked to leave the property. Um, <clears throat> and from what I was able to determine in talking with him, he was not the person that committed the act. He was with the group, but he was not the person that committed right, the act. I appreciate that. Thank and you. yes, so he's asking that you please look into his termination. All right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Ron Howell. I'm sorry, that was him. That was him. Manuel Cadenas. And as a reminder, three minutes, please. Good evening. And, and, and also, no mention of particular names, please. Thank Will you. not. Um, good evening. My name is Manuel Cadenas. I'm a third year teacher at KM, uh, 16, 16, 16 years in the profession. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Mr. Howell. Um, I am uh, one of the few um, staff members that were assisted by Mr. Howell. And um, just to keep it short, I know it's late, and I know we have some students in, in the house. Um, I believe that he's just due process. Uh, he, he's, he's overdue a due process, so I'm speaking on his behalf. Uh, also, as a male of color, I know how important it is to see ourselves reflected in our everyday lives. And um, let's say that there are a lot of relationships left, left on the table at KM that are constantly asking for the status of Mr. Howell. So um, I would have loved to have seen more of our staff out here uh, speaking on his behalf. But I want you guys to know that there, there, there's, there's a vast number of them that are willing to speak on his behalf. So thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Siante Graham. Not here. Okay. All right. Uh, we will move now to our legislative update with Director Hardy, please. All right. Thank you. I since this is like the, the last legislative update I'll give, um, and, and there's some upcoming information uh, and some upcoming things. I wanted to review kind of a little bit of what a legislative rep does uh, as, as this board and, and incoming board members prepare because every school district uh, in Washington State selects one of its members to serve as the legislative representative. Um, they can do this annually if desired or the person who comes to keep the role. Um, and, the, and the legislative representative really has four things that they do. Um, mo some are time bound, <coughs> such as the was the legislative assembly and legislative conference that happened recently. And I'll provide an update for that. Um, and then the other is working with either directly with legislatures or with WASD or with other advocate groups during an open legislative session, which begins January 13th, 2020, um, and, and works with them to either advocate directly for the school district or advocate for other positions, such as the WAS positions that I'll update on, um, as well as coming back and doing this every two weeks, uh, which is sharing the legislative update with the board. With that, last time you heard from me, um, WAS had completed its legislative conference, or legislative assembly, where basically all of the legislative reps uh, get together and vote on priorities that WASDA will help take to the legislatures, legislators, and of course we support as well. Um, but it's across all districts. So, so some are statewide, some are very specific, uh, and there's multiple, multiple uh, positions that, that can be taken, either carryovers from prior year or new ones that were introduced. I'm gonna give a rundown of kind of the updates uh, of what's being supported 
student safety and support, staffing needs, and funding model equity. Now those topics are the same as prior years, uh, but some of the other things are actually some staffing needs, reducing, reducing local district fiscal impacts related to the school employee health care benefits, i.e. SEB, updating the prototypical school model to actually reflect uh, school and student needs. Um, one of the priorities is also the support of uh, the development of a state salary schedule for all employees. Um, funding model equity is, is a place to where we as a district don't necessarily have a lot of stake in this. A lot of their positions are focused on what they would call property poor districts, um, ones that don't have a lot of residential land, have either forestry land or just open land, uh, and making sure that the funding model applies to them um, as opposed to, to property rich districts, if you will, um, but also specifically around, around being able to attract and recruit people to those positions. Um, so there is a very long document out there if you'd like to read it about the whole legislative priorities, many of which were the same as last year, slight amendments. Um, but this is what that both WASD as an organization will support, and they have their day on the Hill, where at least legislative representative, but of course, all y'all are welcome to go down uh, and actually meet with legislatures. They're very open to meeting. Um, as soon as you get, if you can get time with them, or at least someone on their staff, open to meeting, hearing what our priorities are, uh, and seeing how they can do it. It budgets up this year, uh, and there's a lot of other things, either budget related or just law related. Um, that can be put in place. And so January 13th is the beginning of the session, but beginning is very um, just coming together and doing committees. There's not really much going on. Um, usually in February is when we have the day on the hill. This year's was interrupted by snow. Um, hopefully it doesn't happen again. But the idea of, you know, forming stuff is just to go through committee. There's the whole legislative process. It's long, um, but at least keeping in touch with them because there are a lot of impacts to education. A lot of our representatives, ones that cover our kinders together, are very supportive of education, um, including some that are championing the breakfast after the bell, uh, as well as increasing special education funding, which is you know still out there on the table to to kind of main, fully fund special education. Um, so looking forward to that. Obviously, as a citizen, you can still get involved. They're legislators; you voted them in, so um, you can still contact them and support these initiatives yourself. And that's my that's update. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ross. All right, we're going to take a little um, shift in uh, in our usual process here. Um, as uh, many of you may know, uh, it is the last regular board meeting for three of our board directors, and um, we wanted to just honor their time um, with our district. And for some, it's been decades. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, it's a very emotional time, I'm sure. Uh, I could see Debbie in her emotions. Um, so I just, uh, I, I know Dr. Watts uh, would also like to chime in here. Um, but I want to thank Debbie, uh, Karen, and Ross uh, for all that they've contributed. And I'd really like for it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> of all the work that board directors do and very few people see um, the amount of work that goes into this and um, I just want to thank you all for everything I know it's been a rough few years <laughs> that we've gone together um, but at this time you know I'd like to afford you the opportunity to say anything you'd like to share Go first, Karen. Do <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> well, nine and a half years ago, I joined the board of directors. I was appointed, and then I ran twice. Um, but every day that I drive by students or walk by students, um, if I'm in my car, I say it out loud. If I'm walking by them, I don't say it out loud. But I say, um, you don't know it, but you're my kids. And I really feel that way.
every time a yellow school bus drives by, I think about waving at the bus driver and then they're always watching the road, so I know that they're not gonna pay attention to me waving at them, so they're doing their jobs. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have supported the students, families, and staff of Kent School District and working with the leadership team they're so dedicated. It's just incredible. I mean, all you guys, you're amazing. And you're, you're, you're amazing. I will continue to support students and families of our district through my new membership in Rotary. Um, Kent Rotary really focuses on feeding families and literacy for students and scholarships for students. And I'm really, that's another way that I'm gonna be involved. Um, I'm gonna to continue to mentor. I love my mentees and, and I've had some really great success with at least one of them and I'm working with a new one now. So I hope that the new board members will come to their new positions with ready to learn minds and ready to collaborate hearts. Um, so thank you to everyone who's gone out of their way to help me learn and understand the intricacies of working, the workings of the Kent School District. I have some less emotional updates because I actually had some like <laughs> regular things I wanted to share and then, and then just a summary because, you know, like I didn't, I'll, I'll scoot back to seven years ago. Um, we were looking to move out of Seattle for many reasons, some of which still exist today, but affordability was a big reason. Um, and we had two kids at the time um, and looking to expand our family. And I looked, we looked at a bunch of different places, mainly in the South End. Um, and where we settled on, where we live now, uh, and, and kind of the Panther Lake area, it, what, what sealed it was was the school district. So not only the school proximity that my, that my kids would go to, which is right across the street, um, but what else was available within the district. And, and so I've been involved for, for a long time as a parent um, and kind of as, as that, that school community member. Like I would walk around the school, elementary school, Springbrook Elementary School, um, and think of it as, as my school, help pick up trash, help a ball went over the street and into the ditch and get that back in. Um, you know, making sure that they install those uh, speed cameras on time and things like that. Um, and, and it's always been something that's, that's a part. And well, not even my youngest just started kindergarten this year. Uh, that's the class of 2032. That's at least how long I'll be here. But again, she's not even my youngest. Um, <laughs> And so I know, I know that I'll be around. I, I, I say that I, I came in kind of knowing that I wanted to push through a lot of change. Um, I think I did what I wanted to do. My business update is um, Clark Newber team's going really well. Uh, they've been here on site working with you know, our, our requested audit. They're here working with the staff. Uh, they're doing their data mining and they're gonna be ready uh, to start processing and presenting that soon. Um, that's something that we um, made sure it happened. Um, and some of the other things that, that I think about, I, I live, if you saw the presentation earlier today, um, I live right near the old Panther Lake site um, where they're putting in the, the new academy school. And so I think about other districts maybe not even in Washington, uh, across other states that aren't building new schools, they're having trouble retrofitting old schools. Um, and we have two brand new schools uh, that are coming in and we have early, and we're talking at least two years from being opening and involved in what's going on, what's being available, um, how are we investing, how are our tax dollars, because that's what these are, how are they being invested? Um, and that's one of the things that this, the school district does very well. Um, and I, and I like the changes, hopefully all the changes that, that Ben and I have worked on, on, on the data that's being presented. You know, I think at the beginning I had 60 questions. He answers probably now 59 out of 60 before I even ask them. Um, so I love that, I hope that progress stays. Um, obviously I'll be around for a while and you know, you may be seeing <coughs> me back up here eventually. I describe this to my um, family as kind of a bittersweet moment. Um, I've been on the board for 12 years and um, seen a lot of change over those 12 years. And 
I'm leaving feeling like we've made some good changes. I've had the opportunity to work with amazing people, both on the board and in the district. Um, some of the things, sorry, I didn't think I'd be this emotional. Sorry. <laughs> <It's just laughs> um, things like dual language and um, KPA and iGrad and changes to how we do different things as simple as making sure we have more access to our AP courses and really looking at every day. Full day kindergarten. Full day kindergarten, yeah. <laughs> and how we can make the world better for our students. And also for looking at how we can impact and make our district great, including helping the people <clears throat> in our district that work for our district. One of the presentations we had recently was on PD. And I think this is one of the first times where I've seen where we've really looked at not just PD for our teachers, which is so important, but also making sure that that's available for all of our staff and how we continue to do that as a district to make sure that our students are successful. I've been, like I said, on the board for 12 years. Before that, I served on committees for 10 or 15. And so I, um, I kind of feel like it's my graduation day in some mm -hmm. ways because <laughs> as I reflected back, um, my husband and I were talking last night about you know how many students' hands have I shook over the years, oh you know, my gosh. It's probably close to ten thousand or more. As you know, you're looking into their eyes and going, you know, go forth and do good, and I'm um, hoping that you've helped lay the path so that they can be as successful as they can be. And so I will continue to um, watch and be involved. But I'd like to say thank you to all of those that I have had the opportunity to work with. I appreciate you. And um, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, we're not done. You're not done yet. We still have a meeting on <laughs> yeah. December 4th. So. That's what we're meeting, though. I look forward to seeing you. <laughs> All right. And um, did we say? Oh, um, OK. Uh, well, I just want to say um, thank you to all of you as well. It has been um, a pleasure working with you. Um, you know, it's it's interesting when you run for school board and you get, I think you have these ideas about what you think it will be, and then quickly you realize it's not at all what you thought it would be. Um, but the support of, you know, board members and people who are willing to help you um, as you move forward in the work is really important. And so I just appreciate that from, from all of you. So. Um, thank you for, for your support in that. Um, really quickly, I um, was very excited to um, celebrate Veterans Day, and I know it's a little bit late, but um, I appreciate. just want to express my appreciation to all of the veterans that are here. Um, if there are any, your service is um, greatly appreciated and recognized. I had the opportunity to attend the Veterans Day Assembly at my kids' school. And I, I am a mother of two veterans. Um, one of them is most as recently got out of the service in July. And so um, I understand the sacrifice um, that families make. And so it is much appreciated and recognized. So um, that was an honor. Um, I'm excited. Um, Ross mentions breakfast before the bell. And I'm very excited tomorrow to go and um, get a tour of that program. I'm a little bit familiar with it, and as someone who in my past has worked to support feeding students, um, I've ran food programs in my past work in, in the districts, um, and um, you know, it, it's important. And, and many, many, many kids come to school without um, proper breakfast and proper food, and so I just really, really um, am looking forward to um, that program expanding. It's a wonderful program, and it's an important cause. Um, other than that, I'm looking forward to going to the WASDA conference next next week um, and looking forward to um, seeing some of our new board members there. So um, other than that, you guys, thank you so much for coming. It's always wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see the students that come. And so I wish you um, a good rest of your week. Thank you. Now it's very late, so I want to thank you all for attending and staying this late, and uh, we wish you all a good night. Thank you for coming. We're adjourned.